This is the uh, third topic in the eight topic sequence that we um, have here at Hopkins. And I'd like to start with introducing you to uh, Linda Mutian. Hi. I know a lot of you probably from support, so I don't know your faces, but I <laughs> probably recognize your email addresses. <laughs> And uh, this occasion is being uh, videotaped as usual, and so you will have it on the web after a couple of weeks. Let's see, how many of you are here for the first time? Wow. Oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. And how many of you are, are repeat offenders? Repeat offenders. <laughs> All right, that's okay. Let's see, um, we have a lot of um, ground rules to cover, um, but um, I think Linda will do that for us. Do you want me to do that now? Yeah, why not? Okay. <laughs> All right, well, obviously, there are a lot of people here today. So um, just administratively, we teach the class in four approximately one and a half hour sections. And we ask that, and we'll have a break at 10 approximately, and then lunch from 12 to 1.30 approximately, and a break at three. And um, if we spill, have to spill over into the one and a half hour lunch, we will take a shorter lunch. But what we like to do is we ask that you not ask any questions during the one and a half hours. If you have a question, jot it down. Usually the question probably will be answered in the next, thing, next few things we say. That usually is what happens. And if that's not the case, then at the end of each section, we take questions for pretty much as long as you can ask them. So that's why we somehow get off schedule a little bit. But anyway, so we, we ask that you not ask questions during the time that we're speaking, but we will give you an opportunity to ask questions after each section is over. We also invite you to ask us, come up and ask us questions if you're shy and don't want to ask in the whole group. You can do that during breaks and at the, just before lunch, and we try to come back a little early also from lunch to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Did I miss anything? Yeah, and then at, we're gonna go until the bitter end tomorrow at quarter to five is where, when we end. So um, hopefully you don't have early flights out because most of the excitement comes towards the end as usual. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a cliffhanger thriller. Right. <laughs> and we have uh, extra light on the stage today. So if we uh, look like we're um, Squinting is because uh, we're not used to the, uh, to the lights up there, but it makes the video a little bit better. We have a little bit of a problem with the left screen here, but um, I think it's going to be all right. So do you want to get started? So we're going to get started, folks, without further ado, and um, <coughs> try to spend as much as time as possible on the, um, on the modeling issues rather than uh, overviews. And we have a, an interesting uh, table of contents here, taking us from quite simple matters to quite advanced matters. And it gets even worse tomorrow, or more interesting, perhaps one should say. So um, I'm not going to talk a lot about M plus background, because um, you have this in your uh, handouts, and um, many of you have heard the uh, overviews. Just want to alert you to the fact that you should um, be using, if you're using M+, you should be using version uh, 5.21 today, because that has the latest, uh, fastest algorithms, latest fixes. And it is, there is a version 6 being worked on right now. We're very excited about that. We'll let the content be a surprise, a uh, happy surprise for all of us, and um, hopefully coming within short. Uh, we're going to talk about the unifying theme of latent variables, continuous latent variables in the left column and categorical latent variables in the right column. We're going to talk very little about the right column today. Uh, that's going to be dealt with in uh, future courses. So we're going to stay with continuous latent variables. We're going to talk about, um, in topic one and two, we talked about measurement errors and factors. Today we're going to talk about random effects, mostly random effects which we're going to translate into uh, so-called growth factors of growth models. And tomorrow, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about survival analysis, where issues like frailties come into play. Be we are also going to talk about variance components, different uh, variations uh, in the data that we're going to try to uh, quantify by estimating variances. And we're certainly going to talk about missing data. 
we're missing data on a continuous variable implies that we have a continuous latent variable. So it's missing for everyone in the data. And here are the models that use those latent variables. Uh, we're going to take a look at growth curve models in particular down there. Whereas in topic one and two, we talked about factor analysis and structural equation models. And we tried to summarize that in a picture uh, using uh, the uh, M plus notation, which you have here for the background variables of X and the um, dependent variables of Y if they're continuous or U if they're categorical, latent continuous variables being F as in factors and C if they're categorical, categorical latent variables. <laughs> now, um, we're not going to talk about the multi-level features today, but that will be actually um, coming about one year from today at the end of this course. Uh, but just know that when we talk about growth modeling, for instance, <clears throat> we can also do growth modeling in uh, cluster samples. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Okay. This room holds 198 we have about 200 people registered, and then we still have 50 name badges. Did any of you not get your name badge? Because it's not possible that we have 50 name badges still standing. Does everybody have their badge? Sort of getting there. I know I've asked this different times. Unless this room is wrong. Everybody got your badge? So all of this generality uh, implies that M plus can be used for a lot of different things. Some people think of M plus as a structural equation modeling program. And we get a little bit miffed uh, when, we, when we get portrayed that way because that's just one of many things that is done in M plus. And actually, the focus is not that narrow, but uh, it is a general modeling program that achieves its generality by working with latent variables, as you saw earlier. So it's several programs in one in that sense. It, it does exploratory factor Let's see, did I go out? No. Exploratory factor analysis quite well. This one went out. And particularly in the uh, version five of the program, we strengthened that feature quite a lot by um, offering uh, generalized types of factor analysis in the exploratory sense. So you can do multiple group exploratory factor analysis. You can do longitudinal exploratory factor analysis. It's a very strong structural equation modeling program, very general. And uh, it actually combines exploratory factor analysis with structural equation modeling in the new so-called ESEM feature that uh, is described on our website. It is a good item response theory analysis program, uh, which is used in educational testing, for instance. Latent class analysis handled. Latent transition analysis, which is latent class analysis taken over several time points. <clears throat> the program does both discrete time and continuous time survival analysis with recent additions for um, continuous time survival analysis, make, making it incorporated in the latent variable framework. So you can do Cox regression uh, with uh, continuous and categorical latent variables, for instance. And we'll, I'll, I'll refer to applications of that, uh, a report that soon will be put on our website. Well, I'll do that tomorrow. <coughs> it's a good growth modeling program. It's a good multi-level analysis program, and it's getting better. And a very strong complex survey data analysis program dealing with weights and uh, clustering and stratification. And you can also do Monte Carlo <coughs> simulations, methods studies within the program. All of these pieces are fully integrated, which makes it unique. It's not w do one thing uh, only, but you can, for instance, combine item response theory analysis with multi-level analysis or uh, survival analysis in a complex survey data setting, things like that. So it's a very rich framework that can inspire you to do new things. Now. Uh, we were here last August and talked about topic one and two, which uh, is the um, background for today. We are going to refer back to those, the content of those topics several times. 
not go over that again, certainly. So we are here at topic three, March 22nd. That's today, I think, and uh, the introductory and intermediate growth modeling. And then tomorrow we'll um, kick in another gear and do advanced growth modeling, survival analysis, and end up with missing data analysis modeling, uh, which will be particularly relevant to the growth modeling and drawing on survival analysis concepts. And that incorporates some new thinking that is uh, at the research frontier. I send you an email. I actually send you uh, two emails. And if you didn't get any of them, then uh, your address wasn't entered correctly somewhere somehow. But anyway, it was an email that referred to a couple of papers. If you didn't get the email, you can send me an email. And I'll send you the email. Uh, <clears throat> then we're coming back uh, at the end of the summer in August to do topic five and six. And that will be uh, focusing on categorical latent variable modeling, which is also called mixture modeling or latent class modeling. First, uh, cross-sectional data, and then the longitudinal data aspect. Then we're going to throw in an extra topic uh, that will be new, new, uh, newly written, and that will be for the third day, so we're going to stay three days then, and talk about what's new in M plus version six, which will be a big surprise. Uh, pleasant fun, as I said, I hope. Uh, that will be, um, we'll focus on that, that uh, day. Spend a whole day on that. Then we come back a year from now on and talk about topics seven and eight, multi-level modeling. So we go multi-level with every topic that we talked about in the previous six plus topics. So, and that's where it ends. We'll see what happens after that. So now let's take a look at some typical examples of growth modeling, get our head into the thinking about uh, this kind of modeling. And, and throughout the days, we tend to focus on modeling, thinking about models that is matching a real data uh, question with a model. We try not to talk so much about technical details, try to talk less about estimation, for instance, although we'll certainly say something about it. But we're going to focus on trying to formulate models, trying to understand models, and trying to interpret models in terms of examples. But we're going to try to, throughout, motivate that modeling by real data examples. So here's the first example. And um, let's see if I can use this screen, or if you get a headache looking at it. There is a new projector that got um, rented and it doesn't work as well as the stationary one. Uh, your handout is probably clearer than this. So anyway, we have here um, a math achievement testing for a grade seven through 12. And uh, so we have a, a score, an average score on the y-axis. Uh, later on, we're going to talk about how it was created. It's created through IRT, item response theory techniques, but that's not important now. And we look at males and females. Males are the squares, and females are the circles. And we have two cohorts going forward. So here's the first example, longitudinal data where you work with different cohorts. So when you start a study, uh, you look at one group that starts in seventh grade, seventh grade, and another group that starts in 10th grade. And they're put together on the same axis here, so the dark circles, the dark uh, symbols, rather, are in the older cohort, starting in 10th grade. Uh, so we're not following people from 7 to 12 here in this picture, <clears throat> but it's broken up into two cohorts. And we're going to talk about how to best analyze multiple cohort data, or accelerated cohort data. So here, uh, we're looking at the mean scores, and we're looking at how, in early grades, females seem to do better than males, whereas in later grades, it looks like males overtake females and do better. And we're going to see um, uh, if, why that might happen and if that's really true. Uh, but we're going to also emphasize that um, these uh, this kind of uh, representation of the data is not perhaps the best one for model building. When you build a statistical <coughs> model, you want to start from individual data, from, start from the individual, not from the aggregate, because nobody in the sample may look like, may have a developmental curve that looks like this. 
The uh, mean curve is put on a different scale here. Here you can see what you can do with statistics. If you squeeze together the y-axis, looks like there is no improvement in math at all here in the US, whereas it looks pretty hopeful on the left. Uh, but the point here is rather to move from the average to the individual curves where you have the, um, in, an individual here starting very high and growing at a healthy rate in the achievement score, whereas this individual starting lower has pretty flat development. And you can also see whether or not uh, the development seems to be linear. For this, this top person it looks linear, but for this second person here you have a dr drop here. Is that a feature <clears throat> that's shared by others or not? Um, so you look at this from the point of view of shape of the development and variation in development. We see that we have variation in the starting point. Some start high, some start low. And we're going to ca capture that by a variance parameter. And we're also looking at variability in their growth rate over time. This has a high growth rate, this person. This person has a low growth rate. So certainly we want to have a model that captures variation in uh, starting point and growth rate. Somehow the model must incorporate those individual differences. Then we are not going to be satisfied with looking at only one process going forward, like math achievement, but we're also going to take a look at uh, parallel process models, for instance, looking at math achievement together with math attitudes, to attitudes towards math and how that progresses over time. And it looks like the average math attitude actually goes down here. People uh, tend to uh, not like math the more they get to know it, <laughs> which is a shame, I think. I'm glad that 200 people here like math as much as you do. Now, here we have another data set. And here certainly we do not have uh, linear growth, but very nonlinear growth. This has to do with head circumference of babies over time. So we have uh, a child at birth, age zero. This is when the child gets born. It sort of has existed before that, but we'll ignore that for now. So we measure them up to uh, 36 divided by 12. Mm, okay, some time. And then we have this development where the solid curve is the average, but the uh, broken curves, which you see more clearly here, the broken lines are the individuals, uh, individual uh, babies. And actually, in this case, it's a very a small subsample of babies. Uh, those with broken lines are babies of mothers <coughs> who drank quite a lot during their pregnancy. So you see that they seem to um, have a lower developmental uh, path of head circumference development. It's in millimeters here. And they look, you can ask questions then. Do, um, does the uh, initial status of head circumference at birth differ significantly for those who uh, had mothers exposed to alcohol uh, versus those who didn't? And is the growth rate different across time for babies of mothers who, who drank during pregnancy versus not. So that's a question of um, these covariates influencing, covariate of uh, prenatal alcohol exposure, influencing the initial status and the growth rate. Now this example is tricky also because it is a nonlinear growth and it has another feature which makes it very hard Actually, I have not found a satisfactory growth model for the data yet. Not only does the uh, mean increase uh, over time, but the variance decreases over time. And um, that is a little bit strange because, um, I mean, we're only seeing a subsample of the uh, children here. It's, it's a little bit more difficult to analyze those kinds of data, as we will see. Here we have loneliness in twins. You may not have known that twins were lonely, but um, you might have thought, well, they have each other. <laughs> but um, here they are lonely. It's actually from a paper in uh, Twin Research in Human Genetics with Dorit Bumsma in uh, Amsterdam uh, coming with the data. And uh, us doing an analysis, 
where uh, the different graphs here are from uh, one, two, three, four, five different occasions, five occasions. And um, let me put that up on this screen too. Five occasions, and uh, the x-axis is actually age, if you could read that. I think it says 20 up to 80 for each of these um, panels. And on the y-axis, you have a count. How many felt lonely, I guess? No, how many people, how many people there were, rather, at different ages? So here you have, uh, <clears throat> at the first measurement location, most individuals were around 20, some were a little younger, <coughs> maybe 50 up to 21, 22. And occasion two, of course, uh, which is 1995, four years later, after 91, four years later, uh, obviously the, the cohort, the group has moved up in age, but there's still variability uh, in age uh, around the uh, average. And then occasion three, what happened? Well, this graph moved up. They became older because this is, this is in 1997, two years later. But on the top of that, we're sprinkling in new observations. New people come into the study, and some of them are older. And then onwards and upwards for occasion four, uh, where uh, the, uh, the graph moves to the right further, and perhaps there's some more sprinkling in of people. So the point of this is to say that um, here we have a, a, an example of individually varying times of observation. It's different than on the left screen. In the left screen, everybody at the, everybody at the uh, second measurement occasion are eight months of age. Here, at the second measurement occasion, uh, not everyone is of the same age. And in fact, on the third measurement occasion, you even sprinkle in more people. So where in, on the left screen, it's natural to have uh, the uh, occasion, it doesn't matter if you have the occasion, measurement occasion, or the age as the uh, time axis. On the right, it certainly would matter. On the right, you wouldn't want to have occasion as the time axis, but you rather would want to have the age. So at each occasion, you should allow for the variation in age among the people at that occasion. And uh, you may want to scribble here, uh, the M plus catch word for that or option is called AT, A-T. So as we get back to that, we'll take that into account by using the A-T option. This will be an example where you couldn't handle uh, the growth modeling by a standard structural equation model, uh, mean and covariance structure framework. You need something more general. So that's an interesting uh, example and um, even more so, the, it had a uh, feature of uh, multiple items. They tried to measure uh, loneliness, and they did so by um, looking at items like, I feel lonely and nobody loves me. So uh, this slide is to uh, point to the fact that items may look similar. They may even come out to be one factor, unifactorial, in a factor analysis, but if you put them in the growth model, they may have very different development. The I feel lonely item has this development over age, whereas the um, nobody loves me item is, uh, has more of a flat development over time. <clears throat> so for instance, if you try to sum up these items or create a factor for them, uh, that one variable would not be uh, uh, homogeneous with respect to its development over time. So here is an interesting development. Maybe you didn't know this. Feeling lonely increases between 10 and 30, but you start getting very happy and satisfied around 50. <laughs> it's an interesting. It's a cubic model. So um, actually, you have an intercept, a linear slope, a quadratic slope, and a cubic slope. ISQC is this an example of using M plus language that we'll talk about later. And it seems to be a similar trend for females, although they seem to feel more lonely than men. Although men wouldn't, wouldn't um, admit to that, of course. 
So um, that's that example. So it's very nonlinear, and uh, we may also um, contemplate the possibility of doing growth modeling on a uh, factor if we had items that develop similarly over time. Now the basic modeling ideas then, and I'm sorry I can't move this podium out of the way for you who sit over here, it's stationary, but um, I'll put this slide up on the other one. To just help you think about these kinds of models, um, let's, let's say that you had data on the, for these examples. And you have um, sample size of n, that's the number of people, and cap t, number of time points. One, way, one thing you could do is to um, consider a data set that has n times t rows, n times t rows, and two columns, the column being y and x. y is the outcome and x is the time. So like head circumference and age in months. Two columns, but you put together all the people and all the people's observation and all the data points and you do a single regression of head circumference on time because you want to see the relationship between head circumference and time. So say that you, for, for simplicity, do a, a linear model. It would work reasonably well for the uh, achievement data. So you would get one intercept and one slope common to all individuals, which is not what we want according to the reasoning so far, right? It does not account for individual differences, in starting people starting at different points, people growing at different rates. And also, it has the problem of lack of independence of observations. Because for each person, you have t data points, and the t data points for one person are not independent observations. They correlate highly across time. So we would have a lack of independence and our inference by standard methods would be wrong. So an alternative then is to go to the total um, opposite situation, to the other extreme, and do uh, n regressions with t data points. So say that you have a person has four data points, uh, four, time, four time points measures, and you have then a data set with four rows for that person. Still two columns, y and x, but four rows. So for each person, you could do a regression, regression of the outcome on time. It's not a bad idea to do. It gives an intercept and a slope for each individual, so it certainly accounts for individual differences. But it does not, uh, it does not acknowledge that you have some similarities between individuals. It doesn't really draw on the idea that you draw a sample from a population, from one population, and you want to draw inference of that population. So it gets too, uh, too loose and too flexible. So the third alternative is what we're going to talk about all day today and tomorrow. We're still going to use all data points, and we're going to do a single regression. But we're not going to do a single regression like up here. We're going to do a single random effect regression. We're going to talk about what that means. But essentially, it's going to give you an intercept and a slope estimate for each individual, just like we do here. But it's going to account for similarities of individuals by stipulating that all of them come from a single common population. And at the same time, that will then model the non-independence of observations. Take that, in, build that into the model. So the model captures that non-independence and therefore doesn't suffer from it. So what is that then? Well, then we could talk about that from, from this slide. Oops. So we have this uh, in uh, formulas up here now. We're going to be using formulas very sparingly, but um, sometimes it's necessary and, and convenient. Here we have a um, regression equation. It's a standard regression equation. You recognize y, you recognize x, and you recognize the residual, although we're going to use Greek quite a lot here, so the residual is now called epsilon. 
And also, the regression coefficient, the slope here, is called eta, E-T-A, uh, with subscript 1, and eta with subscript, subscript 0. So eta 0 is the intercept, eta 1 is the slope. Slope is the one that multiplies the x, right? Looks like a standard uh, linear regression, although we use Greek here. But what is um, special about it is that we have subscript i, which is the individual, on the regression coefficients. You never see that in a regular regression book. Uh, in the regular regression book, it's a and b, or alpha and beta. and you don't have any subscript. There's one quantity in the population that you're trying to estimate for the intercept and one quantity for the slope. But here, we actually are putting I on them. So eta zero and eta one are actually random variables. They're random variables. Anything that has subscript I, where I is individual and I is the individuals randomly sampled, is a random variable. So the intercept and slope are random variables, and that's why they're called random effects. It doesn't mean that they're haphazard or anything like that. It just means that they vary across people. So we see, for instance, in bottom left that you have uh, y on the y-axis and x on the x-axis. X is a time-related variable. It could be a grade, for instance, and y could be math achievement. And you're looking at three students, i1, 2, and 3. I mean, notice uh, that they start at different points and they grow at different rates. So starting at different points here in, say, grade 7, it would imply that eta 0 varies across those three people. Therefore, it has subscript i. <clears throat> and the slope, the growth rate, is higher for the first one, for the first student than the third student. And therefore, eta 1 has subscript i as well. Sometimes this is... Um, ex uh, is talked about in multi-level terms, and uh, equation one would be level one in multi-level modeling, level one. What's interesting here, though, is that given that we have turned the intercept and slope into random variables, capturing individual differences in growth over time, we can work with them as variables. We can work with them as dependent variables, as we do in equation two. Here are the ADAS, the random intercept random slope are dependent variables. Equation two is called level two in multi-level modeling. And in equation two, we still look at a, a linear regression. Eta is regressed on W here. W is an observed variable. So eta regressed on W with an intercept alpha sub-zero and a slope gamma sub-zero plus a residual called a Z or a Z, a Greek letter again. But it's a linear regression here. And same thing for eta 1, a linear regression. And we want to estimate alpha and gamma and perhaps the residual variance for, for the residual Z. And note on equation 2, in equation 2, we do not have any subscript uh, I. So they are now regular fixed, fixed coefficients. So, uh, for instance, um, if you have um, eta here as a starting point of uh, head circumference, uh, W may be mother's drinking during pregnancy. As mother's drinking increases, <coughs> the uh, starting point of the baby's head circumference growth goes down. The question is if the growth rate also goes down. Now, we can translate this further into pictures that would be directly translatable to, uh, to M plus input. So we have the picture again. <clears throat> We're looking at this modeling idea, a random, uh, random effect uh, linear regression, three ways. By the picture, this is how the story starts in the data. This is what the data looked like, individual differences in development over time. We can turn it into formulas. 1 and 2, level 1 and level 2, as we said. And we can turn that into a model diagram. Some call it a path diagram. I like to call it a model diagram. Uh, 
where we have taken the example of having four time points. T equals one, two, three, four. And we're looking at, say, um, say math achievement. So Y1 would be the math achievement at time one. This could be grade seven, for instance. Math achievement in grade eight, nine, and 10. So Y, there's one Y variable, namely um, math achievement, on a, in a certain metric that is the same across the time. But given that that single Y variable is measured at different locations, we will treat it as four different variables. But they're measured in the same metric. And then um, the uh, random intercept and random slope are going to be represented in uh, circles as opposed to boxes. The boxes represent observed variables. The circles represent latent variables. Because we agreed that eta zero and eta one are <coughs> variables, they vary across individuals. And since they're not observed, we can agree that they're latent variables. So we put them into circles. And then we want to relate the, we want to understand the variation in these. And we want to ex try to explain the variation in them by an observed variable W. And later on, we're going to call this a, a time invariant covariate. So it's a covariate that's time invariant that doesn't vary across time. So uh, for instance, uh, it is uh, home background in uh, math achievement. And, or it could be mother's drinking during pregnancy in the head circumference example. Something that doesn't vary across time, or at least it doesn't influence the Ys. Uh, uh, more than <clears throat> through the growth factors. So we're looking at this model then. It can be looked at in two ways. You have a relationship between the outcomes, we're going to call these outcomes, and the growth factors. We're not, now we're going to, since we look at this through factor analysis prism, we're going to call this uh, growth factors instead of random effects, growth factors. And you have the relationship between the outcome and the growth factors represented by equation one. And the relationship between the growth factors and covariates by equation two. And that then has the counterpart in the latent variable structural equation modeling, where equation one would be the measurement part of the model, the measurement part of the model, how the latent variables are measured. So you think of Y as an indicator of latent variables. The Ys give us information about these latent variables. So that's the measurement part of the model. Whereas this equation two is a structural part of the model, talking about how um, the uh, latent variables behave and how they relate to other variables. So there's a nice connection there between different uh, modeling frameworks. And we're going to exploit that. So we, we like to uh, look at growth models uh, in terms of latent variable uh, model diagrams. Because once you get used to the model diagram, it's so easy to generalize the models and uh, make them flexible to meet the needs of our research questions. Once you're in this framework, for instance, you can easily imagine that uh, you may want to introduce a latent variable for the covariate. Maybe mother's drinking wasn't well reported. Maybe you need multiple indicators and the true predictor is a latent variable. We know how uh, measurement error in covariates can uh, distort the uh, influence here, the slopes in this part of the model, the gammas. Or maybe we have multiple measures of the uh, outcomes so that we really want to study gro growth in a latent variable construct. All of that is possible. Now, if you look at this model, it looks very familiar to those who you studied topics, well, topic one already, the first day, last August. It's a confirmatory factor analysis model. <coughs> Excuse me. And it is a very peculiar one. Or well, first of all, it's a very stringent one in the sense that W influences Y only indirectly through the mediators, which are latent, only indirect effects, right? There's no direct effect. You could have a direct effect from W to say Y4. Maybe that fits the data better. Maybe that has a 
nice interpretation. We'll get to that later. But that's usually not, that idea or that possibility is not entertained if you are in a multi-level uh, framework like this, not typically entertained. And um, you may also um, wonder about this part of the model where I'm, that I'm circling now. That's where the factor loadings sit in a confirmatory factor analysis. What are those? Well, they are the relationship between the, uh, how the ADAS influence the Ys, or how the Ys are regressed on the ADAS. So influence goes from this to this. Regression goes from Y on these. What are, the, uh, what are those coefficients? What are the loadings? Well, if you look at it, a loading for eta1, for instance, is how eta1 influences y. Well, it looks like xt is the loading. We're going to refer to xt as the time score uh, or the uh, factor loading for uh, the, the slope factor. And here, we're working with time scores that are fixed. They correspond to uh, something that has to do with the grades. So we know what they are. They don't have to be estimated. And eta zero, what, what are the loadings for eta zero? Well, you know, it's how eta zero influences y over time for different t values. How does eta zero influence y for different t values? The same way, right? There's no modification of the eta zero influence on y over time. There's nothing multiplying it with subscript t, like here. It's an invisible one, one times eta zero. Uh, so that means that the factor loadings here are going to, from eta zero to the y's, are going to be one, fixed at one, fixed at one, fixed at one, fixed at one. And the time scores that we are going to have here, the loadings for eta one are going to be related to the timing of these occasions, but they're going to be fixed. So we're looking at a CFA, confirmatory factor analysis model, that's very restrictive. No direct effects, only indirect effects, and fixed loadings. So you may wonder why on earth would that be a good model? And it turns out it is the right kind of modeling framework for many uh, longitudinal data. And therefore, it has a good chance of fitting reasonably well. But you should be aware that it can be modified. Now, um, just a few words before Linda jumps in and brings us back down to Earth. Let's go up uh, and take a, from the sky and take a bird's eye view of the field. <clears throat> there are many ways you can present a topic like today's. Uh, we are talking about latent variable modeling, the latent variable modeling uh, viewpoint as implemented in M+. But certainly, uh, there are many others. Uh, a popular one is the multi-level framework, uh, exemplified by the uh, HLM program by Rodenbush and others. Uh, or, or in statistics, it's a mixed linear model. SAS proc mixed is one common software piece for that. Uh, now, these and SCM structural equation modeling is yet another framework. Uh, you can see how they relate to each other here. You have a, a large degree of overlap. They, they do um, pretty much the same thing with some twists, some, some uh, minor deviations having to do mostly with the software. So um, there are things that can be done in SEM that cannot be done in multi-level modeling or, or mixed linear modeling. But there are certainly things that can be done in those frameworks that can't be done in SEM. Uh, the latent variable framework that we deal with we feel captures certainly all of SCM and most of the other multi-level mixed linear models. There are some things still that those frameworks and software pieces can do that we cannot do. Uh, but there are many things that we can do that they can't do. In any case, our box of possibilities keeps pushed, being pushed up. So with every new version, uh, we, we move uh, further and further to doing what can be done in the other frameworks uh, in addition to what we can do uniquely. So what does that mean for us? Well, multi-level and mixed linear models are pretty much one and the same. It's just different ways of expressing them. We'll look at the difference in a second. SEM, though, you should be aware that SEM, uh, and by SEM I mean 
a mean and covariance structure framework as you are used to uh, looking at it from, uh, uh, say, uh, a LISREL or EQS or AMOS perspective. It differs from the multi-level mixed linear models in two ways, the treatment of the time scores and the treatment of time varying covariates. So time scores, that is, I'm talking time scores here now are the X's that we talked about. <clears throat> X's are data in multi-level mixed linear models, data that you read in. And therefore, individuals can have different times of measurement, like in the loneliness of twins. You can have so-called individually varying times of observation. Not everybody is the same age at the second time point, for instance, or even at the first. Whereas in SCM, time scores are parameters, factor loadings we talked about, right? Time scores X are parameters, factor loadings for the slope growth factor. So time scores can be estimated. So um, although you don't, the SCM framework does not allow for individually varying times of observations, it allows for estimating the time scores. So there's a con and a pro. And we'll talk about that as we go on. So that's one difference. Uh, in M plus, you allow for both of these features. You can handle both of them. That's why we think of the latent variable modeling framework as being more general than the SEM framework. Treatment of time varying covariates, uh, they can have random effect coefficients, coefficients that vary across individuals. Time varying covariates being a covariate that changes over time, like uh, advanced math course taking varies across the grades. And the effect of those can be random, varying across the individuals, whereas in the SEM framework, time varying covariates have fixed effect coefficients for growth models. Coefficients can not vary across individuals, but they can vary across time. <clears throat> this afternoon, after lunch, we're going to talk about these two models played out against each other in detail, so you don't have to worry if you didn't follow all of that right now. And um, we're going to see an example where we test for which model fits the data best. Here is the random effect. Uh, so there are three frameworks, so three times two, six. We have three uh, pairwise comparisons. Uh, here we have multi-level versus mixed linear modeling. Here's the multi-level model as you will uh, uh, encounter it in the Radenbush Bush and Breich book, which I think is a very nice book. <clears throat> As we said, we have a level one and a level two, and we have the uh, model that we looked at before, except we have now added a uh, W on level one. That's different from the W on level two. So this is a time variant covariate, whereas W is a time invariant covariate. And here is the uh, effect of the time variant covariate on Y. It has that kappa, or K, sub I, the random effect I just talked about. And then on level two, you will have three different equations, three different equations, one for each random effect, eta zero, eta one, and kappa. So you explain that variation in terms of the time invariant covariate W. Now, <clears throat> if, you, if you plug in, if you take this equation two, and insert it into equation one, and do the same for all three random effect. You get a mixed linear model. That's how you get to the mixed linear model. Where mixed implies that you have a combination. Mixed means that you have a combination of fixed and random parts in the model. Fixed and random parts. Uh, so you can write the model in this way. If you, if you do what I just said, inserting the random effects into equation one and express it fully, this is what it looks like. And on the first line here, equation 44, you have the fixed part, coefficients, alpha, gamma, alpha, gamma, alpha, gamma, fixed coefficients. And on the second line, 45, you have the random part, which are the Zs, which are the residuals, of level two and residual of level one. They are the random part where we estimate their variances and covariances. 
So the mixed linear model is really only a rewriting of the multi-level model in a way that statisticians like. Actually, statisticians like to write this in matrix form. We'll look at the formula in a second. But I think the multi-level formulation is perhaps more intuitive. So for instance, in output from this model, you have a time times W, the time times W effect, which seems a little um, hard to comprehend. But that's time times W effect. And that is gamma, is the time times W effect. So. Uh, to me, that's a little unpedagogical. And statisticians tend to be a little unpedagogical at times. I'm not going to go through this because we talked about it in general terms. I'm just going to go straight to slide 34 and show the mixed linear model in matrix form. So this is the only way that statisticians would touch this topic. Uh, matrices, uh, where this alpha is the fixed part, and this B is the random part, the random effects part. So they split up the uh, equation two uh, parts into the fixed and the random. Anyway, just so you know how that they hang together, I'm not going to go through slide 35. It is a way to uh, <clears throat> look at the relationship between the mixed linear model and SEM. <coughs> but um, that doesn't enlighten us much today, I think. So uh, with that, I think I'll hand over to Linda for a while and um, see what she has to say. OK, thanks. OK, so on the uh, slide here on the right screen, um, we're looking at two different ways that we can approach growth modeling. And based on how the data are arranged in a wide format, which means the data the repeated measures of the data each represent a separate variable. So if you have four measurement occasions, you have four variables. And the long approach, where you, the outcome is represented in the data set as a single variable, and there's also a time variable that is associated with it, much like Bank talked about earlier, where you have one Y that represents several measurement occasions and then a variable called time which tells you when the measurement occasion occurred. So Bengt has been talking about the wide approach. And if, you, if we take a look at this, you know, we had our growth factors, which we're calling I and S here. We have the formulas that Bengt already talked about, where um, we have our time score. And um, the two intercept growth factor is what we're going to call I, and the slope growth factor. But in the long format, we have, if you look at the bottom here, we have the within part of the model and the between part of the model. And in the long format, we have a cluster variable. So you have to actually use multivariate modeling to do growth modeling in the long format. You can't just have a single level analysis like we do in M plus as pretty much our default, although we also can do the long format. So in the long format, within is level one in multi-level modeling terms, and between is level two. And if you look at the, here we have time, an observed variable time in the box, which influences, the arrow points to, it influences the outcome y. And if we regress y on time, we can get a random intercept and the two filled circles are the way that we represent random effects in the path diagrams that we use. So I is the random intercept. And in the M plus language, we refer to the random intercept as the name of the variable. So that would be called Y. And then the random slope is S. And we give it a slope. We give it a name as part of the M plus language. So when we regress Y on X, we get a random intercept and a random slope in the long format. And on level two, we can then regress the random intercept i and the random slope s on a between level covariate. So that's equivalent to this part of the model, i s regressed on w in the level one approach. So actually, let me move forward.
Wait, you didn't get me forward, did you? Okay, <laughs> here we are. So why would you want to use one approach over the other? So what are the pros and cons? First of all, the wide approach gives you a lot more modeling flexibility. As we're going to see, we're going to be talking shortly about the various parameters in the growth model so we can familiarize ourselves with their names and what they do and what they mean. But in the wide format, we can estimate residual variances for each of the outcome variables and we can have residual covariances as parameters in the model also. Whereas in the long format, you make an assumption just by the model that the residual variances are held equal over time. And there's no, and you estimate a single residual variance in the long format. You can't even test whether they're equal over time because you can only estimate one. So that's, I think, one of the large advantages of the wide format having, being able to have unequal residual variances and to estimate the residual variances and covariances. Also, if you go to an advanced model, like a multiple indicator growth model, where you're really looking at growth on factors over time, the development of a latent variable over time, you can then test the measurement invariance of a multiple indicator growth model, and we'll be looking at that tomorrow, I think. So you can test the measurement invariance, whereas in the long format, you assume measurement invariance. That's built into the model. It's not testable. It's assumed. And then a third advantage along the same lines is that you can have partial measurement invariance in the wide format. So if you have a multiple indicator growth model, you can test whether you have measurement invariance, and if you don't, you can allow for partial invariance, and that can't be done in the long format. Um, it's, e it's more convenient to do missing data modeling of the type that Bengt is going to discuss tomorrow in the wide format, and you reduce the number of levels by one. So, you know, that's an advantage right there. So in M+, a three-level model in HLM is a two-level model in M+, plus if one part of the model is growth. So you reduce a level. Now, the advantages of the long approach is that if you have 50 or more measurement occasions, that is difficult to do in the wide approach. So when you have many, many measurement occasions, there may be an advantage to using the long approach. And we say here individually varying times of observation are available in the long approach. This is not available in SEM, but it is available in the M plus general latent model variable modeling framework. So M plus has a general framework which can incorporate random time varying covariates and also individually varying times of observation. So we, and we can do both the wide or the long approach whichever you want. Okay, so then just to take a minute to talk about the advantages of this latent variable growth modeling framework that M plus uses. One of the advantages is that we can have flexible curve shapes. In a traditional structural, I have to stand so the light doesn't shine on me. I'm not really hiding behind the podium. But anyway, so in a traditional program, you could have a linear model, a quadratic model, a cubic, mo or a, a cubic model. But um, in the advantage of our framework is that you can have a flexible curve shape. You don't have to stick with that. You can actually estimate time scores their data, or rather their parameters in the model, not data. So although traditionally in a linear model they're fixed, that doesn't have to be the case. They can actually be estimated. And um, as I just mentioned, we can have individually varying times of observation. Can also have regressions among the random effects, the random effects being the intercept and slope growth factor. Traditionally, you see the intercept and slope growth factor being regressed on a between-level covariate. But in our framework, you can actually use them as um, 
you don't have to have I and S on W, but you can have something on I and S. So they can be covariates. So they can be not only dependent variables, but they can be independent variables. It's very convenient in the latent variable framework to include more than one process. You can have parallel processes going on at the same time, like Banks showed math achievement and math attitudes. So you can have two processes in the model. You can have sequential processes, one process followed by the other. It's also convenient to model zeros, and we'll be looking at two-part modeling, where one part is, takes a care of explaining a, a, a lot of obs, observed zeros in your data. Multiple populations or multiple group analysis is, or conven is convenient to do also. I mentioned that we can do multiple indicator growth modeling. That's also convenient and allows the flexibility, as I said, of testing for measurement invariance and having partial measurement invariance. And we can also have embedded growth models. So you can have a growth model embedded in a much larger model that contains, it has other things going on in it. So it can just be a one fourth of the model. It doesn't have to be a model in and of itself. And Banks will be showing you some um, examples of embedded growth models. And then categorical latent variables or growth mixture modeling. So that's a topic for, I think, our next, we'll be teaching about that in August. And growth mixture modeling allows you to look at unobserved heterogeneity and see if, if uh, perhaps that fits the data better. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Okay. And then we have, um, so we've been talking this morning about the growth curve model on the left here. Now, there are alternative growth models. This isn't the only way that you can conceive of, of growth. And um, one alternative is the autoregressive model. And, and the way that you decide on the model is it has to do with your data, it has to do with the theory, it has to do with the type of process you're looking at. So growth curve models are generally for a developmental process such as learning, whereas autoregressive models are not for developmental processes. In an autoregressive model, Y2 is caused by, or is predicted by Y1, and Y3 may, is predicted by Y2, but, and perhaps also Y1, but there's no general growth process going on. So you have to think about how your, how your growth process develops theoretically, or whether it has a developmental process, and then make a decision about which makes more sense. And we'll be talking, we won't be talking much about the autoregressive model, but in August when we come back, we will be with latent transition analysis. So that would be a type of modeling you could consider. Now, um, there have been hybrid models suggested by the citation shown below here for models that combine both the growth curve model and the autoregressive model. And these are referred to as ALT models in the literature. Okay. So now we're going to start talking about the latent variable growth, the latent variable growth model in practice. We're going to get a little bit of background right now about time scores and the parameters in the model. And then when we come back from um, the break, we'll look at some, start looking at simple models. I think I'll put this over here. Okay, so this should this is very familiar to you. You've seen this, Banked went over it in detail. What we're going to be focusing on here are the time scores, X sub T. So what we want to know is how are we going to be able to determine what we're going to fix the values at. You know, we're saying that they're fixed, but we haven't talked so far about how they're going to be fixed. We did talk about, for the intercept 
growth factor that all the time scores or the factor loadings, however you want to think about them, for the intercept growth factor are fixed at one because of the invisible one that we see here on eta sub zero. But x sub t, we haven't really talked about how we're going to determine that. And I think I'll actually put this back over here now since that's clearer over here. Okay, and actually figuring out the time scores is, is pretty elementary. For, let's start with a simple linear growth model. And let me also remember, remind you of one other thing that I don't think we've said. Today we're talking about uh, continuous outcomes. So the observed outcomes are continuous. So for a linear growth model, we need two latent variables, an intercept growth factor and a slope growth factor. So in the diagram we're showing here, we have the outcome on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. We have four measurement occasions like we show in the picture, one, two, three, four. And we need to know how are we going to figure out the time scores. So it's fairly traditional, I think, to make one time score be zero. And that gives a nice definition to the intercept growth factor, which we're going to be talking about. So if we say we make the first one zero, and we notice that for the distance of the measurement occasion from one to two, two to three, and three to four is the same. So let's say we measured once a year for four years. So we have what we call equidistant time points, then the only requirement for the time scores is that they be the same distance apart. So you can go from 0 to 1 is 1, from 1 to 2 is 1, from 2 to 3 is 1. So your time scores could just be 0, 1, 2, and 3. Or 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3. So the only requirement is that they be equidistant that the same distance is between the time scores. Now, one thing about them, though, is you don't want them to be too large. So you wouldn't want 0, 100, 200, 300, for example. Even though it would meet the requirement of having the same distance, it could create problems when it comes to um, convergence, because these are used as starting values. And so the model estimation could be starting in some place far away from the solution if you choose really large time scores. And when we get to quadratic models, we'll see that we square the time scores. And if you have a very large value, when you square it, it becomes even larger. And that can also be a problem. So this is what we do if we have equidistant time scores. And what happens in a situation where we don't have equidistant time scores? You know, is this a missing data situation? And no, it isn't. So I'll tell you why. So let's say you have you measured at time one, time two, time five, and time six. Let's say you could not get funding at three and four. For, you were unable to get money to measure at those occasions, which I'm sure is familiar. Well, don't worry. You just have non-equidistant time scores. You don't have missing data. So you have to reflect that in the time scores. For, from time one to time two is one, so zero to one. But then from time two to time five is three, so the time score would be four, and then five and six respectively because each of these is has the same distance between them. So for non-equidistant time scores are just 0, 1, 4, 5, 6, or 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 0.6. So you just, when you're figuring out time scores, you just have, sometimes, you know, you'll have it in months or whatever, and just write it out and, you know, see if the distance is the same and just make the time scores match the distances. So it's not too difficult. Okay, so here we're going to talk about the factors in the model. Just, okay, so. All right, so let's take a look at this. So now we want to understand the intercept growth factor and the slope growth factor. We want to understand what they mean, because we're going to be estimating these models and we have to interpret them. 
So we have our times 1, 2, 3, 4, times scores 0, 1, 2, 3. And what we see if we substitute in 0 here in the first uh, equation where the in time, at time 1 where the time score is 0, we see that eta sub 0, the intercept growth factor, is equal to y at the first time point minus the residual at the first time point. So it's the systematic part of the variation in the outcome variable at the time point where the time score is 0. So we put the time score 0 at the first time point. That's referred to often as initial status, but it doesn't have to be there, and we'll be talking about that later. It can be at the end. It can be final status. But the important thing is that where the time score is 0 determines the meaning of the intercept growth factor. And that's why using a 0 helps in the interpretation. And then we can see that when, in, when we substitute 1, 2, and 3 in time 2, 3, and 4 equations, we find that also that's the systematic part of the increase in the outcome variable for a time score increase of one unit. So it's the systematic part of the increase in the outcome variable. So it's a slope. It's a constant slope. So as the time score changes one, it's the amount the slope changes. So, or, or rather the, out, the variable changes. Now the time scores are determined by the growth curve shape. We've been talking about the simplest case, linear. So the time scores are 0, 1, 2, 3. We're going to be talking about quadratic, and we'll talk about what the time scores are there, and other types of nonlinear not nonlinear models, but modeling of nonlinear shapes. So let's talk now about what parameters we actually have in the model. So we have, we have our intercept growth factor and our slope growth factor. The intercept growth factor has a mean and it has a variance. It's a random effect. It's a variable. It has a mean and then it has a variance. The mean is the average of the outcome over individuals at the time point where the time score is zero. So the mean of the intercept growth factor is the average of the observed outcome variable at that time point. And we call it, like I said, initial status. The variance is just the variance of the outcome over individuals at the time point where the time score is zero. So, and it's the fact that we have these random variables, these random effects, the intercept and slope growth factors, that we can know about individual, individuals' variation in them. If they were fixed effects, we would only have a fixed slope or a fixed intercept. But this is a random effect, so the intercept and the slope growth factors have means and variances. Wait a second. I think I went, oh, I went the wrong way. <laughs> okay, so we just, actually, let me put the other slide over here so you have it all. All right, so the intercept growth factor parameters are a mean and a variance, and the linear slope growth factor parameters, it's also a random effect, so it has a mean and a variance. So the mean is the average growth rate over individuals, and the variance is the variance of the growth rate over individuals. So in th the growth model that we're talking about, people can start differently and they can grow differently. And we can capture information about where they start and how they grow through the model. And we also have a covariance. So the intercept and slope growth factors can have a covariance, and that can tell you how where they start relates to how they grow. So we can look at the relationship between where people start in the growth curve and how they grow. Now we also have, besides the latent variables in the model, we have observed variables. We have our outcome variables. And what parameters do they have? They have intercepts, they have residual variances, and they have residual covariances. 
Now, the intercepts are not estimated. They're fixed at zero to represent measurement invariance. So the intercept of the outcomes are fixed at zero. This is part of the parameterization of the model. So that has to be done. The residual variance, as we talked about, can be free, they can be unequal, and we can have residual covariances. And the residual variances are, represent error, both time-specific and measurement error. So these are the parameters we have in the model. Here's a picture of the model. So here, here we have eta sub zero, eta sub one, the outcomes, and here are the residuals, E1, E2, E3, E4. Now I want to take a minute, we're just going to briefly talk about all of the parameters in the model together and what it means as far as flexibility in modifying the model. We've been talking about, about a basic model without residual covariances, for example. We, but we may want to add those to a model and what happens? What happens when you have a linear growth model over four time points and no covariates? What are the free parameters in your H1 model or the unrestricted model? Well, you have four means and 10 variances and covariances. Because if you have four variables, it's four times five, 20 divided by two is 10 variances and covariances. So that's a total of 14 free parameters in the H1 model. Now, how about in the H0 model, our growth model? Well, we have means of the intercept and slope growth factors, so that's two. We have variances for the intercept and slope factor, that's four. And Variance between them, that's five. And then we have four residual variances for the outcome variables. So that's a total of nine parameters. So if we have 14 in the um, H1 model and nine in the H0, we have five degrees of freedom. So that means we have, we have five parameters that we can free. You know, we could add residual covariances, for example or um, make other adjustments. So what parameters are fixed in the H0 model that we could think about changing? Well, we have, we have all the intercepts of the covariates at zero, the loadings for the intercept growth factors at one, the loading for the slope growth factors are fixed at the time scores, and the residual covariances are fixed at zero. So those are all the fixed parameters, and we want to talk about which of those might be candidates for um, changing the model. So we do, this is just a repetition, really. So let's t talk about the bottom of this uh, picture. What we would recommend would be perhaps freeing time scores. So the time scores for the slope growth factor, we could possibly free one or two of those depending on how many outcomes we have, or we could add residual covariances. Those are two recommended possible changes. What we would not recommend would be to do anything to the outcome variable intercepts. They're fixed at zero as part of the growth model parameterization. And likewise, the loadings of the intercept growth factors being fixed at one, that's part of the growth model parameterization. So if you start freeing those, then you're changing the definition of the growth model. So you wouldn't want to do that. And now I just to want to make a point about why you would, why it is desirable to measure at least four times if you're doing a growth modeling and not to have three measures only. I mean, if it's at all possible. Because let's just quickly count the parameters for a linear growth model over three time points. The H1 model is going to have three means and six variances and covariances, so that's nine. But how about the H0 model? You still have two means for the intercept and slope growth factors, two variances for the intercept and slope growth factors, and one covariance. You don't you still have those five. They're given. And you have residual variances for three outcomes now, so that's eight. So this only gives you one degree of freedom to 
modify the model if it doesn't fit well. And if you use that degree of freedom, you can't test the fit of the model because it's just identified. And if you would want to add residual covariances, for example, you would have to do something else. You would have to maybe hold the residual variances equal or something, some of them. You, you know, you'd have to put some other restriction on the model. So if it's at all possible, you should opt for measuring no less than four times because you don't have much flexibility with a, a three measurement occasion model. Oh, I think I made it. I wasn't sure how far I had to go. <laughs> that was my last page. That was pretty good timing, actually. Okay, so I think we'll take questions then. <clears throat> so we have uh, 15 minutes for questions, I think. We'll, we'll, we'll take we'll, them. We'll go a little bit the, past. The break is supposed to start at 10, but we'll go a little bit past. We'll just cut into your lunch. Okay, I, I, we have to stay on so where we can see you. Okay, I think I see you. <laughs> you mentioned the time point it's not to make them too uh, big. What's that? Would it be the range? Is that like the range is well, one or something? Or could they be orthogonal polynomials centered at zero? No. If, 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 so if let, you, let's, let's okay. get into the habit for the oh, video yeah. to repeat the question. So the question was, um, can't why remember. should the why should the time scores not be on a large scale? Is I that it? That. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, basically, it's it's pretty simple. It's just it determines where the model estimation starts. Think of starting values. So it it puts it out in this area to start when it may want to come back to this area to end. So it's not the it's not the range. It's the absolute value. Yeah, that, it's that the hurts. absolute value. That's one option rather than 100, 200, 300. Right, 100, 200, 300 puts you over here to start. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 might put you over here. You know, it's, it's all a matter of abs absolute value, and it has to do with where model estimation starts. It's related to the choice of a starting value. It just if makes you, the algorithms more efficient. If exactly. You keep down the scale so if you, choose, if you know that a parameter is, is 0 0.5, and you choose to start it at 500, you're just making it hard for it to find point five. Sure. Um, I have a question about the outcome in inner step because uh, we have uh, the inner step as a prospector, but uh, what they can do is out of the inner step. So I don't know how the inner step uh, prospector is So the question is about outcome intercept and I think we want to go back to our, one of our favorite pictures. Question is, you, it sounded like you understood what uh, an intercept growth factor is, but what is an outcome intercept? And um, we can stress that a little bit more by saying that it, you know, we talked about the invisible one here, but there's also an invisible zero. It's even more invisible. <laughs> Which which we'll because, actually see in the yeah, next slide. So if you, if you think about this from the SEM point of view, the point of view of topic one in August, what's, this is a measurement model, but what's missing here is the intercept, what you usually call nu in, in the uh, regular parameterization. There is not a, in the, the SEM measurement model, there's a fixed intercept, but it's obviously zero here. So uh, what we're referring to is a more general model, which has an intercept and then these loadings uh, multiplying the growth factors. And we're going to see, there's a slide after we come back where I show that. <coughs> Might but be those, more those intercepts sit here. They sit here, right? And right. But we'll, like Linda says, we'll, oh. we'll say that in a different way shortly you know, after the break. Because this, these are the regressions of the outcomes on the factors. So in a regression, you have a plus bx, a is the intercept, and in this so case, So you have to zero. be flexible. You, you're talking about two kinds of intercepts. Here's a growth factor intercept, but we're, we're talking about the intercept of the outcomes here. So it's a good question to have early on. In the back there, yes? Oh. Can you hear Bengt? I, I couldn't hear you. Okay, it should be me. Since you've started, yes. <laughs>
Right. So are you saying, so I think the question is when the measurement occasions aren't the same for each child? Or where the, the ages are not the same uh, at, at a given a, a measurement occasion. Right. So but that is exactly uh, the individually, individually varying. varying times of observation. Exactly. Yes. So that's possible using that so-called AT option, A-T option that we're right. talking about. Yeah. Yes, with the stripe. <laughs> We're actually going to look at an example of a estimating growth model and talk about the interpretation. So is that okay for that? It, just a quick answer. It means an acceleration or deceleration, for instance, away from the, so a change from the linear development. So like if it's not totally linear, it kind of goes like that? So it suggests possible nonlinearity. Yeah, exactly. It suggests possible nonlinearity. I think we had a question over here. Oh. I can't understand, but can you? Yeah, so the, the question was about, uh, is, is the growth curve model a vehicle for reduce, reducing the within individual variability? Is you sort of, uh, I think you're playing on the idea that you, the individual is his or her own control. And that, that is, yes, that is the idea behind the, behind the growth curve model. Is that also true for the autoregressive? Uh, I haven't heard it argued that way for the autoregressive model. Um, I guess you could say that, yes, you could say that, but um, it hasn't been expressed in those terms as far as I know. So, but, but this is an important distinction here between these two models, and depending on your, ap your application, you should um, make a wise choice. Uh, here we're saying that uh, the, uh, test the, the test score at occasion two is not dependent on the test score at occasion one, but rather on what you have learned in, since, since time one. So you had to think in those terms to choose the right model. More questions? Over there. Yes. 26. Uh, did you talk about this arrow? Yes. OK. Yeah, so that, well, this is a, it represents a residual covariance. So the, these arrows are residuals, and then when you connect them, that represents that we're estimating a residual covariance. So you have the residuals here are Z0 and Z1, and they can covary here. It's correlation. So they can be correlated, whereas none of them is correlated with epsilon. More questions? Yes. Um, you talk about the, uh, you recommend using F for the uh, individually varying uh, time points. Is that the one you use in the, uh, the multiple code growth model in Google Analytics? So the question is about the at uh, option for individually varying times of observations. And the question is, is that what we use for multiple cohort modeling? I don't think we used at there. No. no. No, but we're, but we're going to have a multiple cohort model example, and we're going to have an at individually varying times of observation example. So you'll get to see how that is used in an example. So that should answer your question. But you're, you're right. that the, the same idea comes up that the individuals vary in age at a given measurement occasion in the multiple cohort. But in the multiple cohort setting, you don't need to use at, as right. will be made clear below. And is that better than just I, th I think if you can avoid using at, uh, it's better in the sense that it's quicker computations. But if you're interested in development over age, you, you can't use it No, but in the multiple it. cohort setting, you can avoid it. And oh, I see And what Linda you're saying. would have a, a good right. example of that. Yes, yeah. in the back.
So the question is, what do you do <coughs> if you're not sure if you're in this framework, uh, in the growth curve framework, or in the autoregressive model? So you may say, for instance, let's take an example. You have achievement growth here, and we said that Y2 is not dependent on Y1. It's more relevant to talk about its dependence on I and S having to do with how much they've learned between grade 7 and grade 8. But then perhaps Y2 performance is directly influenced by Y1 performance. If you did well in grade 7 testing, maybe you'll feel more relaxed and do better at grade 2. So there's a direct observed variable relationship. And you're not sure, you don't feel com comfortable uh, ignoring that. Is that it? I have no idea. <laughs> No, it's <laughs> things. So that would say, seem to say that you have some, uh, on top of this influence from INS, you have some residual uh, uh, dependency between the, the Ys, uh, which uh, can be handled by this alt approach. I haven't sunk into it to, to say if I would recommend it, but it, it can lead to, I can imagine it can lead to complex uh, interpretations. For instance, if you just regressed Y2 on Y1, um, then you're letting uh, I have an indirect effect on Y2 via Y1, and you sort of confound things. It seemed like instead you would want to have the residual of Y1 influence the residual of Y2, uh, so, which captures the uh, autoregressive thinking to some extent, but you're doing it on the residual instead. So you can say epsilon 2 on epsilon 1, which is possible in M plus if you uh, redefine the uh, residuals as latent variables, then you can do whatever you want with them. But um, that's uh, an up upper course treatment, so. All right, folks, welcome back. Go ahead. <laughs> OK. Just while we're getting started, I'll just make a little announcement while people are sitting down. Somebody asked to um, let everyone know that there are more restrooms than just the ones across the hall. <laughs> if you go around the corner from the a table, the registration table, there's restrooms. And also upstairs, there's restrooms to the left of the cafeteria area where you stand in line. So anyway, that. And then uh, the other suggestion was that people move in so that when people do come and they're late that they can find seats on the outside more easily. Move to the center. Move to the center. So that's a suggestion from someone. Take it or leave it. <laughs> okay. You can All get right. So um, have we moved down? Anybody from the so-called spillover room? Very good. Welcome. You can join us here in our little uh, I intimate group of 200 people. I'm glad that the methods interest is alive and well in the U.S. So um, we are con soon going to be past the um, introductory overview thinking and get more and more um, concrete about examples. And after a while, you probably wish we were back into this dreaming about the modeling pictures. but. Um, Bear with me a little bit longer to give a few more general statements before we get into the detailed examples. And one, one page is uh, slide, slide 52. Just briefly reminding you, and you have the same picture on both sides here. Uh, it's a linear growth model here. And just look at the uh, expectation, which is another word for the mean, except referring to population quantities. And the, the mean may be linearly developing or increasing like this for, a, for math achievement. But what does the model imply for the variance, the variance of the outcome? Well, if you uh, take the variance of this expression at the top, it will uh, say that it has one, two, three, four terms. And um, say that the including the covariance between the growth factors, say the covariance is zero, and uh, we have constant residual variance. What this term, the second term implies, you have x squared, is that the variance increases over time uh, very much more rapidly than the mean, in a sense, because it's a function of x squared instead of x. 
And that is, when data look like that, when the observed sample variances look like they're going up like that, it's fairly easy to fit the model. But I just want to point out that you can fit models where the mean go up, but the variance goes down over time. And that is handled by allowing for this covariance between the two growth factors to be negative. A negative covariance can make the, the uh, variance function turn down. Uh, as, as would be needed for the head circumference example, for instance. On slide 53, that's homework for you. You have to figure out how covariances between outcomes at different time points, time point T and time point T prime, is a function of these one, two, three, four terms showed by the pictures here. And uh, when we have time to talk more to each other, we can talk about how that tells you how the model parameters get identified and how you can actually design your own multiple cohort study uh, to uh, estimate parameters of the growth model, even if you only have two time points for any one individual. But that will be said later in a different forum. So now, let me just give you a brief overview of what is a prerequisite for <clears throat> today, namely what we covered in topic one, the testing. Because um, Linda was talking about a, co a covariance structure model, and we'll have that up on, on the left screen. Covariance structure model that looked like this. And she was, talk she was um, skillfully dribbling with degrees of freedom and number of parameters, and all of that is really the thinking of uh, SEM, or confirmatory factor analysis where you look at a model for, in this case, four outcomes and look at the, its means, variances, and covariances. Uh, growth modeling in the SM framework can be done by a mean and covariance structure model. Uh, covariance structure is not sufficient, but you have to have a mean structure as well. Uh, and we have said that not all growth models can be fit into mean and covariance structure models, but um, the ones we're looking at here do, the ones that don't have individually varying times of observations. And it's a good uh, example then to think about when we talk about estimation, testing, and model modification. So this is a brief recap for those of you who weren't here in August or didn't have that or don't have that background knowledge. In terms of estimation, we're going to focus today on maximum likelihood estimation where we uh, think of continuous outcomes uh, late this afternoon when you're exhausted, we're going to talk about categorical outcomes <laughs> just to torture you. And um, the assumption, the baseline assumption is normality for the outcomes. That doesn't mean that we cannot handle models where the outcomes are non-normal continuous. We handle that very well by so-called non-normality robust standard errors and test a model fit. Turns out that the parameter estimates are good uh, using the ML approach even when we have non-normality. But the standard errors are not good when we have non-normality, so we have to uh, use a different uh, approach to, to uh, getting the standard errors. We'll ignore this line for now. We're also going to talk about um, categorical. We also have the possibility of doing categorical modeling, categorical outcomes modeling using weighted least squares weighted least squares, but I think today, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to talk about maximum likelihood estimation also for categorical outcomes. And here is a common misperce mis misperception. Uh, that is that maximum likelihood is synonymous with continuous outcomes. You see that a lot on SEMnet, for instance, uh, this discussion forum. So maximum likelihood can be handled, can be used for any kind of outcome. The likelihood can be formulated also for categorical outcomes. But with categorical, categorical outcomes, we uh, typically also want to have uh, the alternative estimator of weighted least squares. Uh, we're not going to talk much about uh, algorithms, but ML is often done using an EM algorithm, EM standing for expectation maximization, which is useful when you have missing data and useful when you have mixture modeling, the categorical latent variable modeling that we're going to talk about in August. This is estimation. Now, model testing, since you're talking about maximum likelihood, we're going to do that uh, using so-called likelihood ratio chi-square test. 
and robust versions of that, robust against non-normality. And we're going to talk about root mean square of approximation, uh, which is a measure of model fit. And we're going to talk about model modification, which is expected drop in chi-square if you uh, make, if you free a parameter. For instance, if you uh, go from uh, no correlated residuals across time to correlate them, how much does chi-square improve? Well, the model modification indices will tell you about that. <coughs> this estimation talks about estimation of model parameters. You can also go and take a second step of trying to estimate values on these latent variables for each individual. And in this SEM CFA context, that's called uh, factor scores, factor score estimation. Whereas in uh, uh, longitudinal modeling with random effects features, statisticians typically talk about that in terms of empirical base estimation. But it really is factor score estimation using techniques that have been called regression method or base modal or uh, maximum a posteriori using IRT language. So that has to do with getting the individual's score on the growth factors, which could be of interest for certain uses. Those scores are not as good as the true values, and the, that is the estimation quality is not always high. And to determine, to uh, quantify the quality of estimating the individual growth factor scores, we have a concept of factor determinancy, borrowed from factor analysis, that is, which tells you how strongly correlated the estimated fa growth factor scores are with the true growth factor scores. There's a theoretical development for doing that. And uh, it, it, the factor determinancy, the quality of the estimated scores becomes better the more time points you have and the smaller the residual variances are. So you can think of that as the reliability in a factor CFA context, the reliability uh, of the uh, items and uh, the, uh, how many items you have along the time series is. Now, if you go further on this, in CFA, which is what you would use for the growth model on the left, covariance matrix and the mean vector are analyzed. ML, maximum likelihood, minimize the difference between observed and estimated variances. You're always working with trying to make the uh, estimated variances, covariances closer to the observed data. And uh, ML minimizes that difference. Cho ML chooses parameter values that minimizes that difference in a very uh, uh, elegant, complex way using matrix terms of determinant and trace. Uh, here, robust ML, same, as, same estimates as ML, but standard errors of chi-square are robust in non-normality, and in, in M plus language, that's called MLM or MLR estimators. And then we have the chi-square test of model fit. That's the likelihood ratio chi-square test that the model does not fit significantly worse than a model where the variables correlate freely. P-values, you want them to be large, good fit, uh, so H0 is your factor model, which is the growth model on the left. So H0 is your model, the growth model. H1 is a totally unrestricted model, as Linda's talked about. And if the P is less than 0.05, H0 is rejected on the 5% level. That's chi-square testing. Now, very often, chi-square gets oversensitive because of uh, small discrepancy between the model and the reality being exacerbated by large sample sizes. So if you have like 5,000 observations and uh, are missing a little minor detail in the model, the model will get rejected. So there has been a uh, cottage industry of developing model fit indices, like the CFI, TLI, RMSEA, et cetera, that we talked about. And here are the uh, suggested cutoffs, uh, cutoffs uh, suggested in the literature that you have up here, these references. And uh, for instance, CFI is often used. You want to have values um, that are close to one, say 0.96 or greater. This is um, topic one stuff. Now, here's the important one. <coughs> this and the next slide are important. Degrees of freedom for chi-square testing against an unrestricted model, as Linda pointed out, 
Uh, the p-value of the chi-square test gives the probability of obtaining a chi-square value this large or larger if the H0 model is correct. Uh, we want high p-values. Degrees of freedom is the number of parameters in H1. It was 14 in H1 minus number of parameters in H0, which was 9. So df is 5. And the number of parameters in H1 with an unrestricted sigma is this many, uh, 2 p times p plus 1 divided by 2, which is the number of variables, to which you want to add p plus p, because growth models have a uh, mean structure as well, and you have p means. Uh, and that's what you have on the next line here, number of H1 parameters with unrestricted mu and sigma, mu being the means and sigma being the variances, the covariances in the population. Here is an important topic of chi-square difference testing of nested models. That is um, of general interest for all the modeling we do in these eight topics. So we have a model HA, say. A model HA imposes restriction parameters of model HB. Then HA is said to be nested within HB. So HA is a special case of HB. And to test if this special case, uh, which has fewer parameters, so HA has fewer parameters than HB. HA has fewer parameters than HB. To test if this uh, more parsimonious model with fewer parameters, HA, fits significantly worse, it will fit worse because it has fewer parameters, right? A chi-square test can be obtained as a difference in the chi-square values for the two models, using a degrees of freedom the difference in the number of parameters for the two models. A special case of this is that HA is H0 and HB is H1. H1 being reserved for the totally unrestricted model with just free variances, means, and covariances. Now that chi-square, you can either can compute, get the chi-square for testing HA against HB as a difference in chi-square, or equivalently, two times the difference in the log likelihoods for the two models. Because as we will see later on, at the end of today and tomorrow, you don't always get a chi-square test but you always get a log likelihood value. So you can always test nested models using two times the difference in log likelihood, knowing that that is a chi-square variant. With a caveat at the bottom here, chi-square theory does not hold <coughs> if parameters are on the border of their admissible parameter space. A typical example being uh, testing of variances being zero. And here's model modification matter. Uh, modification indices is what is called in programs like Lisserl and M+. And statisticians use the term Lagrangian multipliers. So you can use that at your next cocktail party. Model modification, I estimate for all parameters that are fixed or constrained to be equal, very useful, without having to re-estimate models freeing parameters. <coughs> you get these model modification indices that will approximate what you would have gotten if you free them. So it gives you the expected drop in chi-square if the parameter is, expect, is estimated, and we'll see many examples of that. Expected parameter change, expected value of the parameter if it's estimated, and you can standardize that as well. So with that, we get to uh, Linda's part, and we're getting very close to getting very practical. Thank you. OK, so um, we've alluded to the growth model parameterization as we've walked through and talked about it. But now let's look at it more seriously and talk about the fact that there are two different ways that growth models are parameterized or can be parameterized. And we usually use the one that I'm referring to here is parameterization one for continuous outcomes. It's the most common. And the second one we use for categorical outcomes 
and when we have multiple indicator growth models. And when I describe that, I'll explain why. So here is the invisible zero. So here's our outcome variable, y, equals the invisible zero. These are the intercepts that are fixed at zero, plus the invisible one times the intercept slope or intercept growth factor. So those are the factor loadings of one for the intercept growth factor, plus eta one, which is the slope growth factor, times the time scores x plus the residual. So the parameterization is to fix the intercepts, the first parameterization, to zero, the factor loadings for the intercept growth factor to one, and the factor loadings for the slope growth factor to the time scores. As far as the means of the intercept and slope growth factors, they are free. So I'm going to also move the next slide. Over here. So for the second parameterization, so these alphas are the means of the intercept and growth slope growth factors. Now for the second parameterization, we instead of fixing the intercepts to zero, we fix the inter we hold the intercepts equal. So the single new value shows that there's just a single new estimated because they're held equal. And everything else is the same except for the intercept growth factor. You'll see that it, the mean is zero. So we fix the mean to zero and the slope growth factor mean is free. So the reason that we do this now, if for continuous outcomes, if you change the parameterization to holding the intercepts equal and fixing the intercept, slope, intercept growth factor to zero, what you would find in the estimate for the new would be the same thing as the intercept growth factor mean. It's just shifted to another matrix. But so, you know, they're identical parameterizations, but the reason we use the second one for categorical outcomes and multiple indicators is because let's say we have a polytomous outcome. And let's say it's got four categories, so it has three thresholds. In the parameterization one, we would be fixing all of those thresholds to zero. And that seems an overly restrictive way of doing it. Instead, in parameterization two, we can hold the thresholds, the three thresholds, threshold one can be held equal over time, threshold two can be held equal over time, and threshold three can be held equal over time. So that's much less restrictive of a model and achieves the same uh, measurement invariance that we want. And the same with multiple indicators. If we fixed all of the intercepts over time, if we had fixed them to zero, that's much more restrictive than holding them equal across time. So that's why we have the two. They are equal in the continuous and the case with a binary categorical variable. They're equivalent. So uh, what does that mean in terms of M plus language? Actually, maybe I'll put it on that screen. We're, we're going to be getting a better screen over here after lunch. So. OK. So here on the, on the right screen, for parameterization one, outcome variable intercepts, I put it in words here, fixed at zero. Growth factor means free to be estimated. We, let's see how we would say that in the model command. So the model command in M plus is the command where we specify the model. By is used to define fa continuous factors. And so here I say i, i is the intercept growth factor, intercept growth factor by y1 dash y4 at 1. So following by are factor loadings. So I'm intercept growth factor i fix all of the factor loadings at 1. For the intercept growth factor s by, let's fix the factor loading for y1 at 0, y2 at 1, 
y3 at 2, y4 at 3. And our, these are our time scores, 0, 1, 2, and 3 for a linear four-time point model. And then we refer to means, thresholds, and intercepts in the n plus language in square brackets. So we're saying here, the intercepts y1 dash y4 are fixed at 1, i, which is the mean of the intercept growth factor, or 0, sorry, i is the intercept growth factor, s is the slope growth factor mean, so these two means are free. So the outcome variable intercepts fixed at 0 is achieved by y1 dash y4 at 0 in brackets, growth factor means free to be estimated is achieved by i and s in brackets. So this is parameterization 1, at the bottom is parameterization 2, equal, and the intercept growth factor mean is fixed at 0. So we still have the same i by statement where the factor loadings for the intercept growth factor are fixed at 1, the same thing for s also, but here in brackets we have y dash y1 dash y4 which refer to the four intercepts and then afterwards we put a number in parentheses and a number in parentheses indicates that those parameters should be held equal so that's just another language thing in m plus and then below this we have in brackets i at 0 which says the intercept growth factor mean is fixed at 0 s just being in there says the mean of the slope growth factor is free to be estimated. So, so as we now start going through examples, I will, I will be pointing out to you which parameterization we're using and what you should look at in the output to um, be sure that it's coming out correctly. And we also have, we'll be talking about a special growth um, growth modeling language that we have in M+, plus, which I think is a good idea to use, and I'll say why when we get there. Okay, so let's talk now about the steps. So now you have some background and you're ready to do a growth model, and what are you going to do? How do you get started? And if you, any of you who came to the last two topics one and two know that we're very much into doing things stepwise. It's the safest thing to do. So what is the first step? Well, the first step is to look at your data. You want to always, whatever analysis you're doing, you need to understand your data, make sure it's correct, see what it's telling you, if it makes sense, whatever. So you want to look at your means, variances, correlations, univariate, bivariate, what, everything you've got there. and try to determine the shape of the growth curve. You might have theory that predicts the shape of the growth curve. Or you can also look at your data, and Banks showed that a little bit earlier. In M+, we, you can look at individual plots of the data. You can randomly select them or look at 10 and 10 more, 10 more, whatever. It's easy to do, and it'll give you an idea about what shape the growth curve might take. You know, what's, What's going on? Does it look really like, you know, it changes every year the score changes plus 5? Or does it change plus 5 and then plus 10 and then plus 5 and whatever? But you have to look at it. That's the only way you're going to get an idea. And look at individual plots like Bank showed and see, do most people look like they're having the same shape but just a different starting point? and maybe a different growth rate, or is there more going on in there? You know, that can give you an indication also of perhaps the need for growth mixture modeling. Maybe you have some unobserved heterogeneity in the data. Maybe they don't come from the same population. So anyway, that would be the next thing. You also want to take a look at your means and variances. And as Bank pointed out, the growth model itself in expects the variances to increase over time. But, if, and if they decrease over time, this can create problems in getting the model to fit. So you want to take a look at that. You want to fit your model without covariates 
as a first step, probably just using a linear model just to see ha what happens there. And then make modifications as needed. Once you get a well-fitting model, that's the time to add covariates to see if you can explain the variability in where people start in their growth and how they develop. So that would be your goal. That's why you're interested in adding covariates. Now this bank showed you before. So our first example is going to look at the LSA uh, math achievement data. And you can see the means, and you can see that they're, they, they don't seem to be perfectly linear. Perfectly linear would go like that. There seems to be a little upturn in 10th grade. And you can see the individual curves, you know, this one looks, the highest one looks pretty linear. The lowest one looks like it has an upswing in the, between grades eight and nine. This person looks like they had a problem in the eighth grade and then they got back on track. But you know, you can learn a lot by looking at that. You, know, you, you might pick out two different things you're seeing which would suggest, as I said, so the need for growth mixture modeling. So let me leave that actually on that screen. So on the right screen here, I'm showing you how to do an analysis called type equals basic in M plus. This is a way to get descriptive statistics to look at so that you can look at your means and variances. Now it sounds like Basically, I'm not going to go over too much of the language because I think you're probably familiar with it. We have basic commands like title data variable, variable data command names the data file, file equals, variable command gives the names of the variables and other information. Here we've commented out information about some of the variables in the data set. But the key here is in the analysis command. This is where you specify type equals basic. And also, I wanted to show you the plot command. You, you can say type equals plot one, plot two, or plot three. Plot three gives you everything you, you would possibly get, so that's usually what I use. And a ser the series option you need to use if you have data that are longitudinal. So if you say series equals and you give math seven through math 10, if you put an asterisk in parentheses, the x-axis will have one, two, three, and four on it. Otherwise, you could, uh, there's other options to give whatever numbers you want. But basically, here we, we go, we're asking for type equals basic, because we want to take the first step, and that's looking at our data. So we, in this data set, it has a little over 3,000 observations. We have our mass, math measured in seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth grades. So the first thing we can look at is the means. And we see that there's an increase of about three and a half points between seventh and eighth grade. And pretty much the same, close to it between eight and nine. But it looks like a bigger increase, which we see over here, between nine and 10. So there's a plot of our means. So you know, there, uh, we would try a linear growth model and, and see how well that fits. Covariances with variances on the diagonal, we see that the variances are increasing, 103 in seventh grade, 121 in eighth, 161, and then 189 in, in the tenth grade. So they definitely increased over time, and you know, we have high correlations among the variables, as expected. And so we, if these were decreasing over time, we would just tuck that piece of information in the back of our head to use as an explanation if by chance the model does not fit very well. Okay. Now here's the diagram of the model that we're gonna estimate. So in the rectangles we have math seven, math eight, math nine, and math 10. <coughs> that designates them as observed variables. The arrow pointing into each of the rectangles 
represents residuals at each time point. We have I in a circle, it's a latent variable, the intercept growth factor, and then S for the slope growth factor. They're continuous latent variables, and then we have the time scores pointing to uh, all of the outcomes for both intercept and slope growth factors, and we have the covariance indicated by the curved arrow between the intercept and slope growth factors. We do not have residual covariances. We could have those designated by a curved arrow from mass, the residual for mass 7 to the residual for mass 8. So we're going to start out with a simple model. And I'll just put it over here so that we can refer to it. Okay, so now we're, I'm going to show you the input for the linear, linear, the ELSE linear growth model without covariance. So the model over there on the left. How do we set this up in M plus? So we're just going to go straight to the model command where we specify the model. So we say I buy mass 7 dash mass 10 at 1. Now we can use, because the use variable is because math 7 through math 10 are uh, consecutive in the names and use variable statement, we can use this list function of the dash, so math 7 dash math 10 at 1. Now, for the slope growth factor, we say by, we use the time scores of 0, 1, 2, and 3, so math 7 at 0, math 8 at 1, math 9 at 2, math 10 at 3. Here, in bra square brackets, we fix the intercepts of the outcomes, the math variables at zero, and in the bracket statement next, we free the means of the intercept and slope growth factors. So this is in line with what we've been talking about. Now, the growth language which we developed and which I recommend you using for two reasons. One, it helps you not specify the model incorrectly for like forgetting to fix the intercepts at zero, which was what I always did when I first started doing this, which is why I decided to make the language. And um, it helps you do that. And also, by is really for confirmatory factor analysis. And so it has defaults that are more appropriate for confirmatory factor analysis starting values, parameters that are fixed, things like that. So the growth language, it has different defaults from the by language. So I think you're better off to use that. So for the, the statement, you only need a single statement with the growth language. You just put the int IS, uh, that indicates to the program, since you have two names, that means you're in, one is an intercept growth factor, one's a slope. If you had three, it would assume one's intercept, one's slope, one's quadratic. If you had four, the last one would be cubic. If you had one, we would assume you're estimating an intercept-only model. Okay, so this two indicates a linear model. I is the intercept growth factor. S is the slope growth factor. So all you have to really give is the part after by in the model command, just math 7 at 0, math 8 at 1, math 9 at 2, and math 10 at 3. We fix the intercept factor loadings to 1, we fix the intercepts to 0, and we free the intercept and slope growth factor means. So that's that. And then we want to take a look at our model results, which I'm just going to keep doing this on this screen. And always when you're looking at your model results, you want to verify that what happened is what you expected to happen. So here's our I by statements. And what did we expect to happen? All, well, first of all, let's, let me tell you what the columns of the output are for those of you who aren't familiar. The first column is the parameter estimate. The second column is the standard error of the parameter estimate. The third column is the ratio of the parameter estimate to its standard error, and the last column is the p-value 
that's associated with that ratio, which is a z-score. So what do we see here in the first column? We see ones, and that's what we expected. We expected the factor loadings to be fixed at one. Since they're fixed parameters, they don't have standard errors, and the ratio cannot be computed, so we give 999, and the p-value also can't be computed because of the 999. So that's what you would see with a fixed parameter. The slope growth factor factor loadings, we expect them to be fixed to 0, 1, 2, and 3, and they are. So, you know, we're verifying that that is done correctly. Now, the other part of the parameterization on the next slide is that we want to make sure that the intercepts of the outcomes are fixed at 0. And sure enough, if we look under intercepts, we see that for math 7 through math 10, all the intercepts are fixed at 0. So we've got the growth model set up correctly, and now, you know, we can look at our parameter estimates. So, first of all, remember I and S, the intercept and slope growth factor, are random effects, so they're going to have a mean and they're going to have a variance. So here's the mean of I, and here's the mean of S. So the mean of I is for the growth, or for the time score of zero, which is one, it's the model estimated value of y1 because the time score of zero is at time one. And s is the mean of the slope growth factor, so that's the average growth rate. And I'm just trying to see if I want to, I, I think I'll just go on this one. There was only the means there. And let's also, but let's take a look at the variances of our intercept and slope growth factor down in the middle of the slide here. So I has a variance, so we, s and what, and it looks like it's l large compared to its standard error, so that would in indicate significance. We don't want to really use the z-test when we're testing variances against zero because that's not totally proper, but it does look like the intercept growth factor is the mean, the variance is large compared to its standard error, which would indicate that there was a lot of variability where people started out in the growth process. And the variance of the slope growth factor is also large compared to its standard error, which would indicate that there was a lot of individual differences in the growth rate. So now, let's say that S was not large in comparison to its standard error. That would indicate that people grew, at the, they may have started out differently, but they grew at pretty much the same rate. So if you started out low, you, you never got very far. You, everybody <laughs> stayed pretty much at the same rate. Or, you know, so that's how you would interpret these things and look at them. And the same with the intercept growth factor. Perhaps people started out pretty similarly, but they grew at very different rates, so that the intercept growth factor variance was not different from a standard error, but the slope was. So this is how you look at these things. And you also want to look at I with S, which is the covariance between the two growth factors. And we see here that it is significantly, it is significant, and it's positive. So that means that people who start high grow faster, so high starting points are associated with high growth rates, and lower starting points are associated with lower growth rates. So you could have, that could be negative also, or it could not be significant. So these, so the means, variances, and covariances of the growth factors is how the growth model helps you to understand individual variability, individual differences. And then we have our um, residual variances of the outcomes. And remember I said that in the long format, they are held equal. And you can see here, they are pretty close, 17, 18, 16, 17. But in many cases, they aren't going to be close. Some may be larger than others, in which case imposing that equality constraint could make other parts of the model misspecified. And then let's take a look down at the bottom and, and what do we see? 
we see r square. Okay, wait a minute. R square for the math variables. What, is, what are we talking about here? Well, if you look at the diagram, you see arrows pointing from i and s to the outcome variables. What does that mean? That means that the outcome variables are regressed on i and s. So the r square is going to indicate how much variance in the outcomes is explained by the growth factors. And for mass 7, it's the first time score is 0 here, so it's really regressed only on the intercept growth factor. So mass 7 explains 83% of the variance in the intercept growth factor. So that's how you would think about that. And there's 17% of the variance is not, as not explained. Okay. Okay. No, it's not your turn. <laughs> I just want to make sure I haven't left anything out that you want to hop up and say anything about. Okay, so now we're coming to the test of the fit. We looked at the results first. Now we come to the test of the fit. And we have our chi-square. We're looking for a p-value greater than 0.05, which we don't find. But we also have over 3,000 observations. So this could perhaps be the issue that chi-square may be too sensitive. CFI and TLI certainly look good. They're both 0.99. The RMSCA value, though, is a little larger than one would hope for, although SRMR is okay. So when you have mixed fit statistics like this, you know, you want to keep in mind that it looks pretty good, but maybe you want to look at modification indices or think about other things that you might do for the model. And Bank mentioned to you, so I had asked for modification indices in the analysis, and we get the modification indices, and in M plus, this is how it looks. The first column is the modification index itself. That's the drop in chi-square that you would expect if you freed the parameter. And then there's various other, you get the expected parameter change and some standardized versions of that. But let's focus just on the modification index and talk about it a little bit. So I by math 7, they're suggesting that could be changed, and I by math 8. Well, those are the time scores that are fixed at 1. So we really can't change those. You know, modification indices are given for every fixed and ev parameter and every parameter that's held equal. You know, th the program doesn't say, gee, does that one make sense? Let me only print the ones that make sense. We can't do that, so we have to do that check ourselves. So we don't want to touch those guys. That's not good. The S buys, though, those are considerations. They're suggesting math 7 or math 8. And because we could free a time score. So that's something we could think about. But 7 and 8 didn't seem to be the ones that we would have wanted to free. It seemed like it was more at the end where, where we visually saw the misfit. Then the, mis the with statements here for the observed outcome variables, the math variables, those would, be, those would indicate that we would be freeing residual covariances. So those are definitely things that can be considered. And you can see that, uh, so we have 9 with 7, 9 with 8, 10 with 7, 10 with 8. The largest one being at the end, or rather 10 with 8. And then we have 9 with 10. So it seems there's something going on that we might want to think about. And we also want to remember one other thing. If you choose to free one of these modification indices, you really need to rerun the analysis with that. You can't say, oh, these, this one and this one are the biggest, so I'm going to do those two. Because this one is not going to be that if you free the other one. So you have to keep that in mind, that you have to go back and redo this. So we know now that we could consider free time scores, residual covariances. Let's see what the next page brings. Okay. Once again, it brings something that we, we won't change because these are the intercepts of mass 7 and 8. It's talking about freeing those. Well, we can't do that because that's part of the growth model parameterization. So that's not a viable consideration. So what we decided to do 
was to add the residual covariances to the model and see if that, if that would help with the misfit. So mass 7 to 8, 8 to 9, 9 to 10. So we just did consecutive ones. And if you look below in the bolded part of the model command, you'll see that I did that using the PWIS statement. That is a like a WIS statement, but it pairs variables together. WIS is used to specify covariances or residual covariances, and the model determines which is estimated. So math 7, 8, and 9 paired with math 8, 9, and 10 will get you 7 with 8, 8 with 9, and 9 with 10, which is what we have in the picture. Okay, so it, we still have not achieved a p-value of greater than 0.05 here. We still have good CFI and TLI, but that did um, make the RMSCA better. So, you know, th and once again, going through these model fitting exercises is always slightly dangerous because you want to perhaps get better fit, but you don't want to capitalize on the fact that you, your sample is only one sample from a population that you may want to generalize back to, so you don't want to overfit based on that fact. So you, you want to improve it, but you want to make sure it makes sense. So you would want to think through whether it makes sense to add those residual covariances to the model. So I want, so I'm going to move on to the results here and take a look at what we see. Wait, hold on just a sec. All right. So here they show with the WIS statements. And I, I said something which may have just gone over. I should have said it a little more carefully maybe. But the WIS statement is used to specify covariances or residual covariances. And I said that the model determines which it is. Well, if you, if you have an exogenous variable in the model that you're showing a relationship between, that's going to be, for an exogenous variable, it's going to be a covariance. But for an endogenous variable where you have residuals, it's going to be a residual covariance. So that's what I mean by it's determined by the model. For exogenous variables, means, variances, and covariances are estimated. For endogenous variables, intercepts, residual variances, and residual covariances are estimated. And this gets people sometimes, so <laughs> it's good to specify that. But here's a kind of an odd finding. So we have the residual covariance between mass 7 and 8 is negative between 9 and 10 it's positive between, I mean, 8 and 9 is positive and 9 and 10 is positive, and they're all significant. So if this, these can be caused by, these residual covariances could be not needed if we had time-varying covariates, perhaps, that took care of explaining that variability. So, and if we had time-varying covariates that were positively correlated, we would expect the residual variance to be positively correlated like this. So when you see this negative, it could be due to, for some reason, time varying covariates being negatively correlated, or it could also be due to something else in the model being misspecified. So, you know, we really not, don't have a good explanation for why that would happen. And that's your job when you're working with your own data, which you're you know, to be intimately familiar with, is to think through any finding and try to understand why it happens and what you might want to change. So, you know, there, we're still perhaps not totally satisfied that adding the residual covariances was the way to go for this model. And ultimately, it may be that we want to free a time score. So we're, we're going to be looking at this data in a lot of different ways. So this is just to bring up, it's, I, I, we always think it's not a good idea just to show examples where everything works perfectly, because then when you go home, 
and nothing works perfectly, <laughs> then you know, you're going, oh, well, <laughs> this was a, absolutely no help. But at least this you know, gives you some things to look at to see whether your results make sense or whether you should be concerned and whether you should be thinking a little bit more about it. Okay. And so let's see what we see in the next part of the results that will provoke us to think. So we, s we have variances estimated because the gross factors here are still exogenous. And for our residual variances, we see that they're really large at for, at for math 9 and math 10. My, you know, we started, when we started out, before we put covariates in the model, the residual variances were pretty much the same. Now all of a sudden with the covariates in the model, or I mean the correlated, autocorrelated residuals, I'm at another example here, um, they've gotten a lot larger. And we wonder why. Well, we know that the model itself can take increasing variances, but it could be that the model can't cope with the variances increasing as much as these are. So it may be that for math 9 and math 10, there are actually other covariates that are needed to explain the variability of the growth. So, you know, of the left out covariates. Because when we have a residual variance that's large, we say to ourselves, okay, we've regressed something on covariates. We have a residual variance that's large. That means every th we d could have more covariates to explain the rest of that. So I, I and S are the covariates. The two gross factors are the covariates for the outcomes. So what we're saying is that there could be something besides I and S to explain the variance, the variability at 9 and 10. So the growth model isn't sufficient to explain the variances or the variability in the outcomes. So now let's, something else that we can look at are residuals. So in the output command, you can ask for residuals and the output will look like this. Estimated model and residuals observed, the residuals are observed minus estimated. So the first thing we give are the model estimated. So these are the model estimated means of math 7, math 8, math 9, and math 10. And these are the residuals, so observed minus estimated. And, you know, they don't look particularly big when you look at how big the math means are. But then we look at the standardized residuals. And there's z-scores, so anything over 1.96, we're going to probably want to think about. And except for math 9, they're all over that. They're either over or underestimated based on the positive and negative values. So what that would point to is that probably the misfit is in the time scores. So that applying the linear time scores to that model might not be the best fitting model for that data. So we could consider looking at freeing one of the time scores. And we also have model estimated covariances in this case. So the variances here on the diagonal and the model estimated covariances. And you can see that the residuals are small here. And then if you go on to the next page, what we're mostly interested in is the standardized residuals, which you can see a lot of 999s, which means they couldn't be computed because of division by a negative number. For the ones that are computed, you can see they're small. So I would assume that the problem that we're finding in the misfit is in the means, not in the covariances and variances. Now it's your turn. <laughs> All right, so now we bring in covariates. Mm -hmm. 
And we have uh, alluded to the existence of two types of covariates, the um, time invariant and the time varying. And the time varying are, uh, they're the harder ones to model with. So uh, particularly this afternoon after lunch, we're going to talk about them in more detail. Um, but it, the distinction between them is easy to make. I, they vary across individuals in both cases, but uh, one of them doesn't ex vary across time, whereas the other does. And um, here's one way of drawing this. You have the um, outcomes still up here. You have the growth factors. You have a time invariant covariate W here. And here sits uh, four time variant covariates. So that is then a, uh, the same variable measured at four different time points. And typically, we're going to take a look at several different versions of this, but a standard approach here is that um, we think that each time variant covariate influences e its uh, outcome at that time point. So straight up arrows here. One could imagine that you have a lag, so the time variant covariate of time one could influence not only y1, but also y2, maybe y3 and y4 as well. But this is a typical um, a setup. And um, you can have the uh, effects of the time variant covariates can vary across time if you want to, or they could be held equal across time. All of these covariates are freely correlated, as indicated at the bottom here. And they're not part, that correlational structure is not part of the model. Just like in regression analysis, uh, these would be the so-called x variables, five x variables, and they're freely correlated in regression. And we, our model is not formulated for them, but it's formulated for y, uh, conditional on them, or for y given those x's. Likewise here, uh, you don't even talk about the correlations among these in M plus. Now, we're going to challenge this model this afternoon and to uh, get a little bit more specific about the details of it. But that's the general setup. Here is the growth model with time invariance covariates uh, in the LSA, that it is the longitudinal study of American youth. So that has to do with the math achievement setting. And we have three uh, time invariant covariates, gender, clearly time invariant, mother's education, uh, that could be time varying, I guess. Uh, home resources, also treated as time invariant. So the time invariant covariates typically influence only the growth factors and only indirectly influencing the outcomes, whereas the time varying covariates influence the outcomes directly, like we saw there. Is it you again? Wow, All right. that was a short visit. <laughs> Okay, so Bank showed you the picture. Actually, I'll put it over here. Let's see what's the number? 86. So we're going to be starting out with a simple model with the time invariant covariates. And as Bank mentioned, this afternoon we're going to look at time varying covariates. So you'll learn about them. So basically, what we, our job is right now is to specify this model in M plus. So now, and actually, we're going to be looking at this with two different estimators, ML and MLR. So that you can see here, I've commented out MLR. The default would be ML. MLR is robust to non-normality. So we'll just take a look at, you know, the difference in the chi-squares and see how that's affected by using an estimator that's not robust to non-normality and one that is. So in our use variables command, and the use variables command, or option rather, is used to select the variables for the analysis if your data set has more variables than you want to use in the analysis. So we have math 7 through math 10 on that, <coughs> and now we're adding female mother's education, and home resources. The on option in the model command is used to specify regressions. So it's short for regressed on. So the statement in the model command that's bolded, I-S on, female mother's education and home resources, 
is saying that I and S are regressed on the three covariates. Now, it, I show below here the alternative growth modeling language. Of course, the on statement is the same in both, but if you want the full model with the alternative language. So it's very easy to specify this, and then we estimate our model. And when you add covariates to the model, you always want to check to make sure everything doesn't fall totally to pieces, you know, that you have similar, that the fit doesn't go bad. I mean, if, if you add a covariance to the model and the fit gets really bad, it could imply the need for direct effects from the covariates to the outcomes, you know, because those are left out in this model. And so you want to take a look at that. You also want to check whether your main parameters look pretty much the same. So our fit statistics look good still, so it didn't really change the fit. And now we also, okay, but let's, that was for ML, and let's look at the fit for MLR. So for, and let me put the other one on this screen, so 88. So you can see that the chi-square value is very similar. Had there been a lot of non-normality in the data, then we would have seen a change in that fit statistic. I think it would go lower. Yeah, so it would go lower if there was a lot of non-normality. So that's kind of an ad hoc way to check non-normality. You know, if you use a non-normality robot, a normality ro non-normality robust estimator, and it changes your chi-square, well, that was probably the reason it changed it, so. And let's see then when we add covariates to the model, what that does for our interpretation. So the, the idea is that we have variability in our intercept where people start and variability in how they grow, and we wanna understand why is there that variability. So we have added covariates to explain that variability. And what do we see? In the inter for the intercept growth factor, looking in the third column, we see that all three covariates have significant relationships with the intercept growth factor. In column one, the estimates show that they're all positive relationships. In this situation, female is coded one, and this indicates that uh, females start out higher in the seventh grade. Remember, the intercept growth factor has a time score of zero at the seventh grade, so we're talking about seventh grade here. And we saw that intercept, or intercept, we saw that females started higher in the seventh grade on one of the graphs that Banks showed you way at the beginning this morning. And we see mother's education, and then remember, let's take a, a moment to think. What kind of regression is this? The intercept growth factor is continuous. So for a continuous variable, it's a linear regression. So we just, this is just a simple linear, linear regression coefficient. As for higher values of mothers, as mother's education increases, um, it exp for, for a, a change in mother's education is explained positively for I can't speak bank. <laughs> I've been talking so long. <laughs> For a one unit change in education, the intercept where students start in seventh grade is 2.26. So, so you do it, it's just the same. For a one unit change in home resources, the intercept growth factor changes 1.75. So this is the dependent variable, it's continuous. These are the covariates, females binary, so it's not for a one unit change, it's for a shift from zero to one. Female is one in this situation. So we see that all three covariates explain where students started. But how about how they grew? What happened? Well, we see that only mother's education and home resources are significant, not gender. So this, so this is what our goal is, is to find our our set of covariates that tells us why do kids start out differently and you know obviously we would want them to st all start high 
So is there something we can do to help kids start higher? And why do some kids grow differently? And is there something we can do to make everybody grow faster? You know, this is sort of the point of, of what we're doing here. And we have the ability to look at individual differences because we have random effects. And I think that's something you have to push into your brain. The intercept and slope growth factors are random variables. They have means and variances that represent individual differences. They vary over people. That's varying over people is individual differences. Okay. Oh, and, and then this gets to the next major point here, and then I think we're almost ready for questions. But for the rest of the output, we have S with I. Now, that is a residual covariance. Why? Because S and I are endogenous variables in this model. When we regress I and S on the covariates, it becomes an endogenous variable. And we're going to be estimating residual variances, a residual covariance, and intercepts on them. We're not going to be estimating means, variances, and covariances anymore. And that gets people confused because they go, well, my mean changed signs. Well, no, it didn't. You have an intercept now. But what if you want to know what the means, variances, and covariances are for your growth model? Then you ask for tech 4 in the output command. Tech 4 gives you the model estimated means, variances, and covariances for latent variables in the model. Oh no, there's lots left. <laughs> okay, so here are the means. So these are the model estimated means from Tech 4. And, and you actually see that you get them here for female mothers, education, and home resources which are observed variables, but they, sh they can show up in as latent variables just because they end up in the beta matrix. That doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> but anyway, in M plus, we have a beta matrix. It's for latent variables regressed on latent variables. We don't have a matrix for latent variables, observed latent variables on observed variables. So these have to be turned into latent variables a one-to-one -one correspondence doesn't change anything. They just, things hop around from matrix to matrix and it's really of no importance and doesn't change anything. It's easier for us to do that than to make a whole nother matrix that would accommodate latent unobserved. I hope that made some sense to somebody. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so that's our tech four. So when you wonder, when you add covariates and your means look funny, remember they're not means anymore and your variances aren't variances anymore, and your covariances aren't covariances anymore. You've got to go to Tech 4 if you want to get those values. Now, then I'm going to fairly quickly go through this. But anyway, so here's, we want to know now our model estimated mean and individual growth curves with covariates. So we, want, we know what our model is. And we want to know what our growth factor means are when we have covariates in the model. So we want to know the mean of A to 0 and the mean of A to 1. We want to know the outcome means, so the means of the observed variables. And we also want individual predictions. So we see the formulas here. And then I've also put them I've used the values from the output, and I've written them out just in words. So these are model estimated means are available using Tech 4 and residual option of the output command. So what we got from Tech 4 for latent variables, you can get also from the residual option. So what do we know? We know that the estimated intercept mean is equal to the inter estimated intercept plus the estimated slope times the mean of the covariate female and the estimated slope of mother's education times its mean and the estimated slope of home resources times its mean. And then I just pulled the numbers out and showed you what it is. 
and the same for the slope. So these, I think, you can actually just look at and go through. I think that's pretty clear. It's just a regression equation. The mean is equal to the intercept plus, so A plus B times X, B1, X1, B2, X2, B3, X3. And, and over here, it's in terms of what we saw in our model. So the mean of it's alpha sub zero plus gamma times the mean of W. So these are just all regression equ equations up here, and then their means. Because I want to talk to move on to the topic of centering. So this is not centering as in subtract the mean of the variable to center it. This is centering as in determining the meaning of the intercept growth factor. So the first bullet here says that centering determines the interpretation of the intercept growth factor. And the centering point in a growth model is the time point at which the time score is zero. And so far we've been working with a situation where the first time score is zero. And we said that that is called initial status. Well, we can also estimate the model for different time points, different centering points, and depending on the interpretation that we're interested in. For example, we might be interested not in initial status, but in final status. So we would make the centering point, or the time score zero at the last time point. Or we might be interested in changing the centering at, for each time point, having four analyses, let's say, time score zero at the first, second, third, fourth, for four different analyses, because that allows us to understand what explains the variability in the outcome at that time point. So when it's initial status and we regress the intercept growth factor on covariates, we're explaining time point one, the variability of I at time point one. When we do it at the last, we're explaining it at the last time point. So it depends which, what you're interested in. But when, if you do this and you change your centering, you will get the same fit statistics, exactly identical. So if you change the centering point and you don't, then that means you made a mistake. Because if you did it correctly, you'll get the same. And I'm just briefly at the bottom here showing you how Okay, so time points one, two, three, and four, you know centering at time point one because we did it, zero, one, two, three. So all you do, if you want it at zero, you just subtract one. So if you subtract one from zero, it's minus one, one from one is zero, and then one and two. So if you want it to be at time point two, 2 minus 2 is 0, and so then you have to minus 2 all along here, and you get minus 2 minus 1, 0, 1, and if you want to center at the last time point, which is 3, 3 minus 3 is 0, so you have to subtract 3 from everywhere else, and you get time scores of minus 3 minus 2 minus 1 and 0. Okay, and then we can we can show how we're doing this. If you look up at the bolded growth modeling language statement, you can see that I've centered at the last time point. So mass, I'm fixing the time scores of mass seven at minus three, minus two, minus one, and zero. Then chi-square is fine. We won't look too much at that. But now we can take a look at the results. Now, we see that at the last time point, female mother's education, home resources, they're still significant. The values have changed, but they're still significant. Now, it is the case that that may not always be the case. So that's why it's of interest to do this. S on the covariate should be identical because the centering only affects I. It does not affect S. Now I'm going to just, let me put this, go on to here. I want to point out a paper at the bottom here that Banked and I did several years ago. 
the development of heavy drinking and alcohol-related problems from ages 18 to 37 in a U.S. national sample. And what we did in that was, I thought, really interesting. <laughs> but I was involved, so maybe it was more interesting to me. But anyway, we changed the centering all the way through from ages 18 to 37. And one of the covariates was high school dropout. And although high school dropout really had no impact on heavy drinking at the early part, in the early ages, like 18, 21, et cetera, by the time a person hits 37, the fact that they dropped out of high school has a big impact on heavy drinking. So the covariates can change over time, how they affect something. And although that didn't show up in this ELSE example, you might want to take a read of that and see, because I think it's, it's you know, sort of interesting to study how covariates differ over time. Because I, we were pretty surprised. We were thinking, oh, oh, well, then we thought, well, yeah, I guess if you drop out of high school, by the time you're 37, you haven't, you know, gone back and gotten a job or whatever, you know, you could be pretty depressed. And that could definitely impact your drinking. So anyway, now we've come to a stopping point where we can take questions. And I'm sure you have many. We have to find somewhere we can stand where we can see your hands go up. Okay, so anybody want to start? Okay, how about over here? You. Do you understand? I think, I think the question was, um, uh, before you throw in covariates, you want to establish that there is variation in the growth factor. Yeah, so, so uh, in the multi-level literature, uh, there is uh, the distinction between unconditional and conditional models. The unconditional model does, is the one that doesn't have covariates, and the conditional does. So yes, you, you would like to uh, establish in an unconditional model that there is some variation in the growth factors to be explained. Uh, and then take the second step of, of actually uh, trying to predict the variation by covariates. Sometimes, though, it happens that the variation in the growth factor, say a slope growth factor, may be rather small and even insignificant if you dare to use that z-score. Uh, but when you add the covariates, it turns out that the covariate can still explain variation in it in the growth factor. Uh, and presumably that happens because you have um, more power when you bring in a uh, covariate into the model. You have more information about covariance between the covariate and the outcome. So um, even, even though you ha have a variance in the growth factor like a linear slope that looks rather small, uh, I, would, I would not let that stop me from bringing in covariates and exploring them. And actually, you can have covariates that influence a growth factor, like a slope, without there being any residual variance left in that slope. So you can have um, S on X, say S on W, and uh, S at zero. S at zero meaning uh, the residual variance of S is zero. I think Grodenbush and Bragg's book talks about that in terms of a varying uh, growth factor. For instance, uh, W could be gender. And all that implies is that uh, the two genders, the two major genders, have different mean of the growth, slope growth factor. Okay, more questions. You want to have lunch, don't you? There's here. We have questions over here. So on, on slide seventy-two. Slide seventy-two. So, the, so you have significance here, so the p-value is zero. Is that what you mean? No, I think you're asking about testing a variance against zero. Yeah. Yes. What, what, what's the question? So zero is on the border of the parameter space for a variance. So if you test against a zero, I don't really, you can say this better than me, I think. Is that the question, though? Yeah. 
No. I think um, she framed it that the um, p value isn't really appropriate when you're Right. When it, when it comes to variance, there's a controversy here regarding variance testing, be it by z test or if you square a z test, you get a chi square test uh, and likelihood ratio chi square testing. When you test on the, uh, against a value on the border of the admissible parameter space, variance of zero is at the border, then those tests uh, don't behave well. So there is some writing in the statistical literature on um, uh, caveats uh, in this kind of testing, and there are some alternatives. But I, I would say there, there isn't quite convergence on um, philosophies here, what to do. There are some uh, attempts in the literature. If you email me, I can give you references for it. Uh, so we, we tread lightly here, and, and Linda was careful to not careful to say that it looks like the uh, value to the standard error is large, but she didn't really talk about a test here. We uh, M plus does print out two tape peel values uh, all over the place, uh, sometimes not in places where you wouldn't trust them, but that happens very rarely. <laughs> so that's my short description of that. Yes, we have a question down here. Okay, you do 96 banked, I'll do 97. The first question is, were these, did you calculate them or they, did they turn out? No, I calculated them. They don't come out. Okay. Second, can you get this for the individual? So, can you obtain, say you want to obtain an estimated. Yeah, let me just, it's just a regular regression equation, like it's shown, wait, where, which, I know it's here, right near here. Okay, on slide 95 at the bottom, estimated outcomes for individual I. So it's Y, the Y for person one is equal to the intercept growth factor plus the intercept slope growth factor times XT for that person's intercept. <laughs> I'm not being very clear. Okay, so here's for individual. So for that individual, you take his intercept growth factor plus his intercept slope growth factor times the time score. Right, so it's just because, because in the model, it's y on x, y on i and s. i and s are covariate, so it's just like a regular regression prediction equation. So let me, let me say that difference. So not everybody might have heard that. So, so uh, means, the means that were calculated here they are provided by tech four. But the but an individual's value. But not in that way. Well, it's calculated in that way. No, no, no. But what I mean is that that doesn't come out in the output. Uh, no, it Those comes out in tech four. I thought that's what you were asking. It comes out in tech four. These means are come out in tech four. So tech, the tech four values are computed in this fashion. But then you asked about the individual values. They are not provided by the program. But what, you, what you're provided by, by the program are the estimated factor scores for eta zero, which is eta zero half and eta one half. Right. And from that, you can have an Excel program well, you can do to it compute. In you can do it in define. You can do it in define too, yes. You can use the yes. define command and just say. You define a new variable as a function of your, your estimates here, your uh, factor score values, which you have saved in the file multiplied by that time score. See, if, like if you say save the factor, save equals factor scores in the save data command, these are factors. So you'll get, an, get one for each person. Yeah. Yes, back here. Here, estimate, here on the slide 96, estimated intercept mean is the intercept, estimated intercept. Is the intercept of the intercept. Which is, the, which is, we're talking about, we're, we're talking about alpha zero here, plus the estimated slope, which is gamma zero, times the mean of W. I guess I should point down here, actually. Yes, so, so it is confusing that we talk about intercepts and slopes in two ways, yeah. parameters and growth factors. So just but we have to get used to that because that's how it is. No, it is <laughs> But let's just say a summary. So 
you have an intercept growth factor. And it can have a mean, a variance, and a covariance in an unconditional model. But an intercept growth factor can also have an intercept in a conditional model. So it's like, I, this used to confuse me so much. You know, but you have to just sort it out in your brain, you know, that you have different meanings, use the word in different ways, but in proper ways. And just it all goes back to the uh, two-level formula, level one, level two. It, take the intercept growth factor. It has an intercept, and it has a slope in its relationship to the time invariant covariate W. So when we, alpha and gamma here, are what we're talking about here. Estimated intercept is alpha hat. Estimated slope is gamma hat. And there are just several x variables there. But if you're running a conditional model, you just put tech4 in the output <coughs> command, and you'll get your model estimated from your model, the estimated means, variances, and covariances of the growth factors. Lady in the middle. So the, the question is? The question was about the plot command and uh, the fact that the plot command gives the uh, estimated mean uh, curve for the growth model, uh, except uh, in this case, it, doesn't, it didn't come out in this person's research. Um, it, it wasn't available, but only histograms were available. And that happens for certain models where it's difficult to uh, compute the, uh, the estimated mean. For in a general fashion, namely when you have a combination of, say, categorical outcomes and you have covariates, uh, so where the covariate value will influence what the plot mean would look like. So it's not, uh, it's not evident what the, what the plot should look like. But so in that, that case, I would, I would try to plot the unconditional model. But also, plot if you do for that. If you don't put the series option in the plot command, you won't get anything over time. So it could be that it's not available, but it could be that the person didn't use the series option. So that could be another explanation. Yes, lady in the back. Yeah, so the question is about the residual output and uh, we have the standardized and the normalized. Um, I, I think that was in connection with the uh, unconditional model. The standardized is the, uh, the one that I think is easiest to understand and, and really best motivated. It's a z-score test. And they happen to be very significant here, partly because the sample was 3,000. The normalized, it was, we included that, we may take it out, we included that mostly because we want to be in line with other software, not mentioned, but um, <laughs> what do they say in commercial? The competing brand. <laughs> <laughs> and normalized is sort of uh, looking at the residual in relation to the size of the observed uh, variance or covariance. And there's no real good test for that. So I would go with the standardized Z-score. Yes. Slide 90. Um, it's not significant. The, the slide 90. Yeah. 